I have here a bottle of early 1990s Johnny Walker, 12-year-old. Now, this isn't the exact bottle I was drinking in the early 90s, but it would have been something that looked exactly like this. I drank a lot of it, and I absolutely hated it. I'll see you in a minute. Hello, whiskey folk. Hello and welcome, everybody. I hope you're all doing very well. I hope you're comfortable. I hope you're relaxed and sitting down with something nice in your glass, hopefully ready to uh, enjoy a little bit of Thursday night's uh, V-Pub. Welcome to the V-Pub. Uh, I hope you're all doing very, very well. Tonight, there's no guest. Uh, we can't have Billy Walker or Ralphie or uh, big guests every week. Um, it's nice to kind of switch it up a wee bit and occasionally for me to fly solo by myself. And I think that's that's absolutely fine. Tonight is a wee bit self-indulgent. I hope I'm going to try and shape it into something that's less so. But it's because I was reflecting recently, and we've done V pubs in the past where we've celebrated gateway whiskies and the stories and things, all the reasons that we're into whiskey. There'll be a little bit of that tonight, of course. But tonight I was reflecting on where I am today and where all you guys are today, hanging out with me, hanging out with each other, doing whatever whatever it is you do in whiskey and how it's shaped your life, your friendships, your your weekends, your travel plans and your purchasing decisions um, and everything. And I think that for the most part, it seems to be a very positive and enriching things. But for me, I can trace that whole scenario back to a point some years ago and if I look back, there's a cookie trail of event whiskies along um, along that, that passage of time that's come along and impacted me to such a level that it's changed what I actually do for a living. <laughs> it's incredible. And as I moved from one studio to the new studio a few weeks ago, I was picking up these bottles, some of them open, some of them still sealed. They will be uncorked tonight. And I reflected on these stories and how these bottles have impacted me and why I was keeping them and savouring them. And I thought, some of these have stories, and I bet you some of the community have stories too. That's kind of the rough plan. Uh, I'll go into it a wee bit more in a minute after I've jumped in to welcome some of the beautiful whiskey folk and dedicated barflies out there. Remember, if you're picking this up on the replay, Fantastic. Thank you so much for doing that. I'll have stayed up after this live stream tonight and gone through the whole thing again to try and find bottles and chapters and segments so that you can skip ahead to the bottles or the stories that might interest you. I hope that helps. But for the folk that are joining live, I'm going to jump in and try and grab some of you just now just to say welcome, everybody. Superb. But Whiskey Radar is in. Good to see you, Roland. He's saying good evening, Roy. Fantastic. Whiskey with Molly. Superb. Ben, hope you're doing very, very well and looking forward to welcoming your, your friend Frank, who I got to spend some time with this weekend. Frank may or may not be in. I know he's having Wi-Fi difficulties as he travels around Scotland, eh, but I got to hang out with Frank on Sunday. And on Sunday evening, I was able to welcome him along into the VPUB here and we did a patron-only lock-in. And it was just a really, really lovely, relaxed, calm night. It was fantastic and excellent to finally meet Pete Head, Frank. Good to have you. Hellswood is here. Good to have you, uh, Helen. I hope you and Andy are doing very well. Jean de la Cuisine is here too. Superb, Jean. Uh, Neil Laverty, fantastic, Neil. Ian Graham should have got grouse. <laughs> Good one, Ian. Uh, nice to welcome you in. Uh, Jimmy Legacy, saying I loved that JW Black for years. There is a story to it, uh, Jimmy. Che Francis is here as well. Good to see you, Jimmy, as well. Good to see you, Che. Che is now working up at the Green Welly up in Tindrum. Helen Topper Stewart is here. Superb, Stuart. Good to see you. Max Kreitner is here. Fantastic. Ah, the chat has jumped. I do apologize. I'll try and scroll back up a wee bit. Uh, Simon Ray, Jed Smith, Molasses, Kevin Grant on whiskey. Cousin Kevin's tuning in from Canada. 
Kevin, I hope your travels are going very, very well. I caught some of your Instagram posts and you seem to be very comfortable out here. I hope the jet lag has left you. Quickly popping in and catch it all tomorrow. Feels we are watching this at 16.45 in Canada. Absolutely. Well, you, now you know how all the North Americans are feel, feel, buddy. Nice to have you, cousin Kevin. Whiskey 101, Nick is here. Uh, good to see you. And Dave Cummins here too. Superb. Neil Cochran, Malt Punk. Good to have you in, Malt Punk. Welcome here. Uh, Ian Bose is here, Rolf Nordley, superb Rolf, I think this is the first time Rolf I'm welcoming you in, it's wonderful to have you and have your support my friend, Tom Elmer is here, superb, Whiskey Julian, Gregor, time for a dram, Whiskey Julian that looks like it could be a new name too, Aquavity ready for a great V-Pub whiskey evening, thank you Julian and a welcome here, uh, uh, Rolf is here, Ebhead, colourless blue things, uh, uh, Danny Hebbington, D Danny, thank you very much for your recent support, my friend. Nice to welcome you in here. Uh, Menno is here, Ryan Sutherland, uh, Bruno Martins in Portugal, Christopher Malloy, good to have you, Chris. Jim Whiskey Novice, Luna Aaron, Everwind, Chris, superb. Mark Rayner, superb, Mark, good to see you. Uh, Lee J. Brown, just so, so many of you. Well, well, over 200 of you, and already. Nice to welcome you all. I hope you're all doing very well. Yeah, I held up this at the intro. Because I think so many of us have one of those stories where we maybe came to whiskey a wee bit too early or we, we hit it a wee bit too hard or we drank it in a way that perhaps we had to learn the hard way that it wasn't a good way to enjoy it. Um, I don't know. I was living away from home at the time. Maybe it was that expat, uh, you know, patriotism you feel, that sense of uh, longing for home or whatever it may be. But I remember being out with friends and hey, somebody prompted me to drink whiskey with them. They were a whiskey drinker, I wasn't. And I drank it like I was drinking everything back then. I wasn't really thinking about flavour or taste. It was really just a drink. And not being used to drinking whiskey, um, it affected me in a way that uh, was uncomfortable, honestly. <laughs> uh, funny for a while and then disastrously not so funny. And I could taste it for days after that. It was painful. And I decided wow, I really don't like whiskey. That was me in my early 20s. And it would have been, I, I remember it was Johnny Walker, that's the only recollection I have. Um, but it's a very good chance it would have been this bottle in this very livery, this early 90s livery. Now you can see I've opened this and I have to tell you that this is one of the best Johnny Walkers that I've ever tasted, this 1990s bottling. It's fabulous stuff. Um, and it's drawing from stocks back then that would have been drawn from the whiskey loch. So there would have been some really quite nice whiskies poured into this, I suspect. It certainly tastes like that. It's delicious. I couldn't appreciate any of that back in back at that at that time. I can't even remember what I was mixing it with. Probably just water. That experience was enough to stop me looking at whiskey for another almost 15 years, until I was 35 years old. Callum has just joined the, the Aquaviti Barflies. Callum, welcome, thank you so much. Thank you for your support. Somebody else joined as well. I don't want to miss that before it disappears. That's gonna give you guys a uh, Callum Craigie, two Callums, welcome, both Callums, fantastic. Um, that's gonna give you access to all sorts of uh, other wee uh, emojis and things to help you color up the chat, both in the live chat and in the comments underneath. Um, and it helps uh, support the channel uh, for not too much money, one ninety nine and whatever cur currency you are and where you're living. So that was that was where my whiskey journey, if you could call it that, started and immediately stalled. Welcome in everyone, and thanks for your support. Cheers. The whiskey that's in the glass now is what recovered it. And that is another story. Uh, Marcel Bergmeister is saying, for me, it was the green bottle of Glenfiddich. It gave me the shivers. So is that either the one that, that you didn't connect with? Actually, you'll see it just about there, Marcel, that bottle there. That's a, a late 80s, 1990s bottle, a bottle of Glenfiddich there. It's been through quite a few livery changes since. Um, uh, and Jimmy Legg is saying, I had plenty of those experiences with J.W. Black, but the love for it always came back. Maybe that's obviously a love because you'd connected with the flavour, which I had not. 
John Della Cuisine said I had a similar experience with Glen Tallach in my 20s. Took me about eight years until I got a bottle of Glen 12. And Matt Bishop is saying, all your JW purchases have funded the new experience that opened today. <laughs> That's right. Um, I had a look at the, some of the prom promotional videos and things. I had a look at the venue. It looks very slick, very polished, very well done. Bit of a jewel in the crown out there in Edinburgh for whiskey, a, a new whiskey pilgrimage spot. And I'll reserve final judgment until I actually go and look at it for myself. But all the promotional content that came around it was very reminiscent to uh, the promotional content that was around the new McAllen distillery opening. It was very, very fresh and vibrant and young and friendly and very cosmopolitan feeling and very polished and very lifestyle orientated and luxury goods orientated. I think that there's a place for that and I understand why that it's, it's, it's done like that. But I think that... I always feel like a little bit, it's, it's a little bit jarring because, you know, the, the Scotch whiskey that you come to know and understand is represented in such a way that you don't always recognise. But that's okay, because it's not pointed at me. It may be something I can still touch and enjoy. But I can tell immediately that that experience might not be trying to attract someone like me. <laughs> uh, you never know. You never know. I, I'll reserve judgment. I may be proved wrong. Tommy Elmer is saying similar experience with Cousin Jack across the pond and uh, Acos, uh, Gergley. Oh my goodness. Gergely. Oh my, I am absolutely destroying your name, my friend. But I'm going to raise a wee glass and thank you for your support and hope I don't, <laughs> I haven't offended you too much. Welcome to the Barflies. Thank you. Jack Daniels, obviously, Tommy Elmer is talking about there. And Andrew Butler is saying, I hated teachers' grants in Hague that my dad bought, so I drank Jameson until someone bought me a Glenfiddich 8 in a pub. A Glenfiddich 8, that would have been the core expression. And that sh tells us all how long Mr. Butler has been enjoying single malt whiskey. Nice to have you in, Andrew. Lee J is saying, my first, and I will always be grateful for what uh, was Monkey Shoulder. Cheers, Aquavite, a very recent uh, to the fold as well, Lee J. And Monkey Shoulder is doing a good job of converting people because it's meant to be easy to mix and enjoyable in cocktails and a good sipper. And it does it very, very well. Ryan Sullivan is saying, up north, Barnhall dances. Oops, it's just jumped. Sorry, Ryan. Barnhall dances. Uh, were rife with basic and cheap cheap blends. Absolutely put me off for years until I came back into it through uni. Good for you, Ryan. Some uh, guidance at university would have uh, set you straight there. Peter Morris is saying, I had a similar experience with Bells. Never thought I'd get on with it. Funnily enough, I've been enjoying a hot toddy today, made with it this evening. It's funny how we kind of come, we're taught to understand things a wee bit differently. Graham Brown has joined the Barflies again. Also a patron, Graham, thank you so much for your great support, my friend. And Whiskey Influencer Tim is saying, what is the JW back black from New Pulse? Actually, no, this would have been after I came back home. I was living in the south of England at this time. I don't remember drinking any whiskey when I was out in New York, Tim. Um, so, yes, eh, I was drinking Scottish beer. I was drinking McEwan's when I was, <laughs> it's that thing you do when you're away from home. You need something to anchor you. And Tweedley as well has also joined the Barflies this evening. So many of you joining in. Whiskey Malt Content, so good to see you in, my friend. Eh, that's Vlad, isn't it? Cheers to you, Roy, and all the Barflies. Slancher, good to have you in, Vlad, and thank you for your dram. So I've got some uncorking to do. Each bottle is going to is going to represent. I've got too many bottles to get through tonight. Honestly, there's just so much to choose from. I'm spoiled for choice. But I'd like to have a couple of bottles that I can actually uncork with you because I think it'll be interesting to see. You know, as I uncork this, will nostalgia have made them better in my mind than they actually are? Um, and I'm thinking, why am I keeping these bottles here? Why I, I'm keeping them because I want to open them and share them with friends so that I can kind of relive the initial impacts that those bottles might have had with me. And I can't think of better friends to share it with. We're still in a state of lockdown. Yes, I can start to have people in the house carefully and with canny thought and things, but we're not getting a lot of that bottle opening done. So I'm going to open at least one or two tonight um, and try and kind of share an example of how this whiskey affected my whiskey journey in the hope that it's of interest to you and uh, some folk can relate. I've also got lots of wee stories from the community that's been sent in as well. I had way more than I can actually read out and use, but I think they're interesting. And I think it's it's nice to see patterns emerge 
that we're all what we've all gone through this kind of similar thing where we're not sure we're not sure and then we get we get turned off perhaps or we need somebody to reach out and give us a guiding hand somebody to explain that it's not something you just throw back that it's not something that you drown and just drink like a beer or whatever it may be that it's something that can actually be savored I hope my audio is good tonight. Tell me how my audio is. It should be fine. There should be no technical difficulties tonight because Ralphie isn't here. And if Ralphie appears <laughs> in the lounge tonight, tell me and I'll be on my guard because he usually <laughs> brings some interference. Simon Ray is saying, loved whiskey since my dad first introduced me to Glenn Tw Gunford at 12. However, first Jack Daniels sip neat while watching a spaghetti western was not so positive. Exactly my thing. And Max is saying, brilliant audio. Audio is fine, Ian Graham. Audio is fine. Chris Pollack, fantastic, guys. Thank you so much. Audio is bang on, Roy. Superb. I did have to buy a new mic. I tried to fix the old one. I've had it for five years. I think it should have lasted a wee bit longer than that, but whatever. There was nothing I could do. Took it apart, had a look, rebuilt it again, put it back together. It looked, worked fine for a bit, and then the buzzing started again. This one is new. Hopefully it's good. Here's a cool wee story to share with you uh, from my friend over on the east side uh, of the US. I think he's in Massachusetts, though. This is Brian Calavi. You know him as Kilco, and his channel is um, Brian's Whiskey Musings, I think. Uh, I'll give the short ve version, Brian says. Since my entire story is long, all things considered, my father and I worked on creating the audio book entitled Whiskey Women, the untold story of how women saved bourbon, scotch and Irish whiskey, written by Fred Minnick. My father reads the story and it's my job to listen to it for chapter editing and any minor corrections needed before publication. It's a wonderful story and it made my father become curious about something called Lefroig. We tracked a bottle down at a local restaurant, ordered a pour and well, my father fell in love with peated scotch. I had a sip myself and well, I think those who know me can understand what happened next. It's been an unbelievable experience to meet so many whiskey folk from all over the planet due to the amazing whiskey tube community. So many have been encouraging me and their astoundingly generous people. Whiskey has truly changed my life for the better, says Brian. That's a fantastic story, Brian, and something that we can all relate to. You, your guiding hand, your inspiration to take that step was your dad. And his was Fred Minnick through the book. And that's a book I need to track down. Whiskey Women, the untold story of how women saved bourbon, scotch and Irish whiskey. I bet you that would be fascinating. Fred has obviously got his own active channel on YouTube as well. Great stuff. Kilco Whiskey Musings, says JG. That's exactly uh, Kilco Whiskey Musings. Um, his channel on YouTube. So thanks for that, Brian. Cheers to you. This is what's left of uh, the whiskey... Uh, that brought me back. So many people have heard that story, but I think it's worth telling again because it just makes sense to go in chronological order this evening. And also the people that haven't heard the story before or read it, it may be worthwhile just understanding how I could go from having a really negative experience with whiskey, declaring to the world, I don't like. Doesn't whiskey teach us time after time, after time never to say, I don't like? How many times have you said, I don't like that particular profile, that particular distillery, that particular whatever it may be? And then one day you're sitting and you go, this is fabulous. What is this? Only to discover that it's the thing you've been declaring you don't like. And I'm talking about whiskey itself is the same. Certainly true for me. I literally said the word, the words I don't like. And I'll share that story with you just in a second of when I uttered those words. Jimmy Legg bought me a dram to say, I would have been in your living room next week if we were living in a normal world, but my will is not broken. Jimmy, do you think it would be safe for me to give you an invitation to my living room? <laughs> Buddy, I know it's bittersweet. It's bittersweet. We can be here together. Despite it, it just means, as I keep saying, we just need to pause these things and wait for a wee bit longer. It's, things are still upside down, topsy-turvy, a bit crazy. And we just need to continue to be patient for a wee while. Things are getting a wee bit better. Jimmy, I'll raise a glass and say thank you, my friend. I, I know you're uh, holding a wee candle for your pilgrimage to Scotland, and we are too, buddy. I can't wait for you to get here. Cheers. Cheers. 
Ronald is saying, good evening, Roy. Let me guess, there's Glenn Goyne in your glass. When I recall from earlier V-pubs, that is where your journey started and where mine started too. So many people did start at Glenn Goyne and you're absolutely right, Ronald. Lucas is saying, I don't like McAllen prices. Change my mind. Nope. You're going to get no argument here, Lucas. You're in good company. Excuse me, Whiskey Crusaders saying, hey Roy, good to see you. Good to see you too, Matt. Wonderful to welcome you in here, my friend. It would be amazing. <laughs> Gordon Dundas is in here as well to hear the Glen Goyne story. Uh, fantastic, Gordon. Welcome in. Uh, Global Brand Ambassador for uh, Ian McLeod. Yes, so it's called, it's come, become known, I refer to it as the Luca story. And I was working for an Italian company and there was a gentleman based in Rome called Luca. And uh, he was coming over to spend a few days in Scotland because there was an exhibition here and some business to be done in Scotland, which is a rare thing in the uh, high-end electronics industry. It's, there's not so much of it here. But there was a conference going on, an exhibition. Um, and when he arrived, he said, Roy, I love Scotch whiskey. Please, before I return home, we need to visit a distillery. And the words came from me. They hit <laughs> Luca, sorry, you've asked the wrong guy. I don't like whiskey. I know nothing about it. I don't know where to start. His reaction was one that still takes me by surprise to this day. He looked me straight in the eyes and he said, you live in the country that makes the finest spirit in the world and you choose to know nothing about it. It was in the early days of Google. I came home 2005. This was September, specifically 2005. And I found a small distillery not too far from Glasgow. They did tours after a wee phone call and a check. I booked up a couple of tours and went back to Luca. The next day to say, Luca, before you go home on Wednesday, we'll be able to go and visit a local distillery to here. Fantastic, Roy. Thank you so much. Tell me, what is the name? said, Luca, it's a very small distillery, just very close to here. It's called Glen Goyne. Fantastic. One of my favourites. Incredible. I thought this was this tiny local distillery. How could he know about it? How could he enjoy this thing? He's living his alfresco lifestyle, all these fantastic Italian wines, the cuisine, the outdoor living, all of it. How could he be enjoying whiskey? But I took him to Glen Goyne. And I was struck by his engagement, his knowledge, the questions that he was asking. And I was driving that day. And as I was sat in the small tasting room that's still there, they don't use it so much now, it's behind the, the cash uh, register there. Now, there was a screen up on the wall and they had a barrel in there and I was leaning against the barrel with a tiny, tiny pour. And I heard everybody talking about it. I heard the drink being introduced and I talked about the aromas, the nose and everything. And I realized how small a pour there was in the glass. This can't be too challenging. And the first sip was hot and spicy. The second sip I held on my palate a, a bit longer. The third sip, every single light came on. This was not whiskey as I remembered it, as I understood it. This was a completely new thing. This was a sensory delight. I left that tasting room straight through the shop t-shirt <laughs> bottle of Glen Goyne, 10 year old, eh, a water jug gifted to me by my friend. I've actually pulled it out for tonight. This was gifted to me that very day. I don't have the bottle. Um, and eh, this has been, I guess, the, the only original thing that I still have from that day. That was from my friend Simon, a gift. And I came home with that bottle and my wife said, whiskey? You bought whiskey? And now, with the benefit of hindsight, I recall the story and say, no, I took a step. That was Glen Goyne, specifically their 10-year-old, which disappeared for a wee while after that. Daniel Williams has bought me a generous dram. Daniel, thank you so much. Can't stop in tonight. Have a dram on me. You star, Daniel. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to welcome you, Daniel. I think you're out in Germany, my friend. I know we've been speaking in the background a wee bit. Thank you for your dram, Daniel, and thank you for stopping by to say hello to your fellow barflies. Cheers, buddy. And I can also welcome Evan Callitz. Evan, welcome to the barflies. Thank you very much also for your support, Evan. Superb. Andrew Hamaker is saying, my Scotch whiskey journey may have started with Glenlivet 12, but over the last three years, it has come a long way. Now it's Glengoyne 12 in my glass for tonight. Cheers. 
it is it does develop and i think it's cyclical i think you go you go chasing certain profiles it becomes your new favorite thing and eventually the next time you come around to do the circuit again you have a whole new appreciation for the things that you enjoyed previously you're able to taste more and enjoy them in a, in a different way with different perspective as you as you learn to understand the landscape a wee bit more jim is saying that being said roy People used to say to me, you play in an Irish bar, therefore you must play Irish music. No, says I. This is a bar in Ireland. <laughs> All the Irish bars are in Spain. <laughs> That's exactly right. There are no Irish bars in Ireland. All the bars are Irish. Superb, Jim. Alistair Gray saying, Glen Grant 10 in 2016 is the one that started my whiskey journey, which I'm very grateful for. Most grateful for the many friendships that have arisen thanks to it. Have a look over my shoulder here, down here, you'll see a Glen Grant 15 that's arrived in the last few days. That is the Glen Grant 15 year old that I mentioned when Ralphie was on last week. It's a new launch, uh, certainly in the UK and Europe, I believe it to be new. It's a 15 year old Glen Grant at 50% ABV. Glen Grant is a distillery that I enjoy very much. I always want it to be a bit more. SMWS Glen Grant can be fantastic, by the way, um, or or indeed any independent bottler that higher ABV experience that's difficult to get as a, an official release from the distillery. So I'm very curious to try that one, but that's for another VPUB at some point in the future. I'll try that one. Um, it's not too expensive, but it's not a bargain either. It's I think I paid close to sixty pounds for that fifteen year old. It's not cast strength, but fifty percent ABV, so it's doing okay. And it might bring something uh, that we're missing in the lower ABVs, Glen Grant, we hope. But I will say that there's no mention on there about chill filtration. You have to assume that they have it at 50%. And there's no mention of natural colour, which is not uh, uncommon. Still, we'll go into it with uh, an open mind and see how we go on with it soon. Can't agree with the cyclic, cyclical thing. I'm at the pinnacle and I'm going to stay there forever. Jimmy. Jimmy. Uh, James Hope is in. Good to see you, James. So nice to welcome you here, buddy. The Glen Grant was travel retail before. I think you're right, but it was also a North American release. The guys could buy it over there. The UK and Europe, James, you might have been absolutely spot on that it was only a travel retail one. wonder if it was 50% ABV in travel retail. Probably. You would know, being a pilot, yeah. Everwind, I love my Glen Grant 16. Uh, we've had the 15 for a while, but to me, not as nice as the retired 16. Um, so he is in the States. So he's he's saying he's tried it. Hoyt has bought me a dram as well. A dram to welcome you back. Glenlivet 12 started my single malt journey. So many people started out on Glenlivet's, Glenfiddich's, Glen Grant's, and those easy uh, to find, easy to buy gateway whiskies. And I bet you're still very, very grateful to them all, as I'm grateful to that Glen Goyne. If Gordon's still in, I'm going to have a wee whinge. I'm sure. Gordon wouldn't expect anything else. I love going to Glen Goyne. I went there on Sunday with Frank. I took Pete Head up on Sunday. And uh, I met uh, Tom Lindsay and we went to Glen Goyne together as well yesterday. And it's just for me to get back out there, to be able to be out there meeting people in real life again is fabulous. But I walked up that little fire escape style stairway as you enter the mill room at Glen Goyne. And it's a very tight little staircase. It goes up three flights. I must have walked up those stairs 40 times or more. And the smells are there, the, that comforting thing that happens when you go there to this idyllic little cottage style whitewashed distillery nestled into that hillside there. No warehouses, no big car parks, no big, no, nothing industrial to spoil the view. Very, very cottagey. Beautiful distillery, very picturesque and bizarrely close to Glasgow. And I think that everybody that goes there, we're lucky to have that so close by to give that representation of a distillery, that kind of non-industrial scale distillery. It's still only 1.1, 1, 1 1.2 million litres. It's not huge, despite doubling in capacity in, I guess, the last 10 or 15 years. But, and here comes the but, when I first where it was going to Glen Goyne, there was a free tour and then a very inexpensive tour, about six pounds. Now it's representative of what's happening in whiskey generally. So the basic tour just now is 18 pounds. I'm not gonna complain about that. I think that's okay. We get two really nice drams. We've got the Legacy Chapter Two and a Glen Goyne 18 year old with that, very good. And it was a very 
insightful tour. The staff there are always accommodating, very, very indulgent and patient. And that whole unhurried thing they try and get through. So it's very enjoyable. But then you go to the shop afterwards and the prices are high. Maybe they're RRP. Maybe they're, I think they're higher than RRP. I did a check on all the prices that you can buy online and in, the, and in independent shops. And they're even cheaper to buy away from Glengoyne than the discounted post-tour ticket price. And Glengoyne are not unique in that. They're not alone. Most of the distilleries have the same practice now. Now, I don't deny that the cost of running a visitor centre is an attraction and staffing it and doing the high-end things that are doing there, giving you the nice reception spaces and, and everything. Running that seven days a week is going to be expensive, but that needs to be subsidised. You should not make the pilgrimage to go to a distillery and have to pay a premium to take away a souvenir. The takeaway from your visit to that distillery is the possibility for you to represent them as a future ambassador. So if you were to take your £36.49 that you paid for your Glengoyne 10-year-old at a discounted price and then discover that you could buy it at your local independent retailer for 35 36 that you could buy it online for anywhere down to £30, you would feel, you would smart a little, I think. And I don't want to just point the finger at Glengoyne. Almost all the distilleries I've been visiting recently have the exact same practices in place. And I think that it wouldn't take much to subsidize that. I'm not expecting the whiskey to be cheap from the distillery, but I'm not expecting to pay a premium for it either. Peter Lay saying, I love Glengoyne. I agree the shop is more expensive than anywhere. And Alistair Gray saying, Glendronach's pricing in their shop is mental. I think it's just that thing. You know, we know that it's a tourist captive audience that's there. We know that they'll just buy it. They'll just buy the whiskey. They'll be, ca they'll be caught up in the moment and things. But you are laying yourself open to them smarting when they get home and realise that they, they were charged too much there. And that's UK prices. Remember, we're not talking about the prices in the States or in Europe and where it's often even cheaper still. Paying to revive Rosebank, that's expensive. Andrew Pierce is saying, uh, that was uh, Menno's multi-mission said that. Uh, I'm not so sure. I would, I would have to hope that that's not what's going on there. I know that we used to joke when the Macallan hiked prices at the new distillery when it opened that we were paying for this cathedral of whiskey through the shop, the gift shop, the luxury boutique, as they called it. And repairs the saying it feels it's uh, taking advantage of a captive audience that distilleries will pay after getting wrapped up in the tour and tasting. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I don't think anybody would, would feel raw at me saying those things, unless there's something I don't understand, unless there's a reason for it to do with logistics or licensing or stocking or costs or expenses or whatever it may be, but it needs to be subsidized. We're speaking about, you know, a few pounds a bottle. And of course, I remember there was a time that the cheapest place to buy Glengoyne 25 was literally go up and take a tour at the distillery and use your discount ticket to buy your bottle of 25 and get it for 220 pounds, I think, 240. It was the best way to buy it. And what an experience it was. And it, amplified the experience of the whiskey because of that. Peter Wilcox is saying, hey Roy, and all myself and my wife Dee are celebrating 30 years together today and I'm sipping a 28 year old cast strength can more bottling of Cameron Bridge. Cheers, I'm going to raise my wee glass. Hey, Peter, I'm going to say cheers and congratulations to Peter and Dee on your 30 year anniversary, my friend. Nice to have you in here. I fully imagine you can't stay for the night, but it's nice to welcome you. Cheers, Peter. I hope the barflies in the lounge will join in uh, celebrating your anniversary too, Peter. Well done. Um, let's move on. I've got more bottles here than I'm going to get through tonight, but I'll try and be as neat as I can be. This is why there are no guests tonight. This is why there's no is it a space side or anything, because I wanted to share some of these stories with you. This one is from a friend, Luna Aaron, over in Germany. And she says... I've been interested in whiskey since I studied in Dublin, a lifetime ago at Fields. Guinness became too filling after a while, and I dabbled in whiskey. Well, in Jameson, she says. Back home, I had my first bottle of Aaron Madeira cask, an early version. 
And that really opened my senses for a whole new experience, sadly, lacking the funds to actually buy whiskey regularly. So I was a catch, casual sipper S, she calls herself. Years later, during our first trip to Scotland, we had to take an urgent pit stop in the middle of nowhere. The only stop providing the necessary services were distillery to Matin. Uh, after following the friendly instructions of the staff, uh, we felt we should buy something at the store as everybody was so nice and welcoming. So again, watching our funds, we decided on a bottle of Legacy, a wee sample bottle, mind you, after finally arriving in our Highland B&B in the middle of nowhere on a very wet and windy walk, I opened the wee bottle. Little did I know that I had started on a journey that night that continues to be full of friendly people and wonderful surprises, including a friendly but sometimes wonderfully ranting Scotsman in front of his kitchen cabinet in Glasgow. Now, I can't tell if Luna's referring to me or Ralphie, eh, but um, as far as I'm aware, I haven't did a, done a kitchen cabinet rant, so it must be eh, Ralph she's talking about. Luna, fantastic. I can relate to that story and it kind of segues nicely into my next story about watching money, considering finances and buying just a wee bottle to sample something. And Gregor Dinkman is saying, I paid £80 for our big perpetuum while it was €170 Euro in the Netherlands. That was nice. Is that you buying it back in the day from our big? How did you manage that, Gregor? Where would you have bought it from? And Jimmy Legg is saying, Ralphie, I think, yes, because Ralphie used to have a set, literally, that was back in the day in front of his kitchen cabinet. So I've got a wee bottle here that, that I'll share with you. So Glen Goyne started me on my journey, uh, and I loved it. I was buying whatever whiskies were not too expensive. I remember thinking £25 a bottle was my kind of price. If I had to go to 30 that was an expensive bottle, and I would really go above 30 It's just the way it was back then, but there were lots of things you could buy in the supermarket. This is back in the day that you could pick up Macallan 12 in the supermarket. You could buy Macallan 15 Fine Oak in the supermarket. You could buy Strathylas, and you could buy lots and lots of different things that you can't buy now. I went on for a few years like that, declaring that I loved whiskey. But that phrase slipped back in again. But I don't like PT whiskey. I don't like it. I just don't like it. I hadn't learned back then. I still really haven't learned now, if I'm honest with you. But that, that crept back in. Fast forward three or four years. 2009, actually, this was four years. And my brother and I are uh, sneaking off, taking the kids for a walk in the buggy to try and get them to go to sleep. And the two of us are heading straight into town <laughs> to see if we can buy anything at the whiskey shop in Inverary while we're up the west coast of Scotland on holiday. And we go into the whiskey shop and we realise that neither of us have any money. We don't have our wallets with us. And we've been warned, actually, before we leave, not to be buying whiskey, just to have a look. We went into the bottom of the buggy and there was enough change in the bottom of the buggy for us to scrape together some <laughs> funds to buy a souvenir. So we were just going to buy a Glencairn glass each and be done with it. But we found this. This tiny wee 20cl bottle of Lagavulin 16. It makes me feel giant. This is just one of the wee 20 CL bottles. Now, my memory tells me this was around £12. It's maybe a bit more than that, maybe 16 or something, but it was not a lot of money, and we had enough money and change to buy this. And we bought it. And remember, I don't like PT whiskey, and I was aware that this was a PT whiskey, but my brother liked it, so I didn't mind. We were going to go home with a wee souvenir that was easy to hide and take back to the holiday accommodation, and that's what happened. The reaction I'll share with you in a second. Marcel Bergmeister has bought me a wee dram as well, eh, and it's got stickers on it. Try again. I, if I don't like, try again, Marcel. Is that what you're saying? Well, I'm going to pour eh, um, a Lagavulin in 16 now. <laughs> this, this thing has never, ever been out of stock in my whiskey collection since 2009. Um, we went fishing. Uh, we... Uh, we, that's a different story for a different time. We went back to the accommodation late and we opened the Lagavulin and I thought, okay, yes, actually this is not as bad as I imagined. This is really quite nice. And as we got into it and as we got down the bottle, I was enjoying it more and more. The last little drop I actually took home 
we went home to our, our house and there was about this much in it. And the fish that we caught, we ate that evening. And then we shared what was left in the bottle as a nightcap. And my brother went to bed and I cleaned up and I was sitting on my own, just winding down at the end of the night. And the flavour that came from this very wee tiny bottle of whiskey in that glass, the effect that it had, the impact, the way that I reacted to it, everything I can still recall vividly and taste even to this day. I know you're thinking it's crazy, but some of you might be able to relate. It was so, so powerful that I knew at that moment that my pursuit, the way I was going to enjoy alcohol, the way I was going to consider whiskey had changed forever. The next day I went to Cadenheads and they didn't have any Lagavulin 16 in stock. There was often times that Lagavulin 16, even back then, would occasionally go on allocation or be in short supply. Cadenheads in Edinburgh and the Royal Mile didn't have stock, but they sold me some of their blended Isla malt from the cask. I did get a bottle of Lagavulin 16 very, very quickly after that. And I, I'll, as I've already mentioned to you, I don't go without it until this very day. Cheers, Marcel. Cheers, everyone. Apologies to everyone that's had to listen to that story two or three times. But the reason I'm sitting here in front of you now is because of that moment. It might have happened later. Something else might have come along to do it. But it was that moment. It sent me on a track of becoming a whiskey geek. To the point that in, at that moment, I started to make a plan for my 40th birthday the next year to visit where that whiskey was made. And 10 of us in 2010 went to Isla for the Fischiel to celebrate my 40th. And it was a wonderful experience. Tom Elmer is saying Lagavulin is life-changing. And Jimmy Lagavulin is saying you look less like a fisherman than anyone that I know. <laughs> Do you still wet a line or two? Jimmy, I think, ask me the fishing story. It's not for tonight, um, but you have called it right. I am not a fisherman, and I'll share with you why. Peter Morris is saying forever, such a strong word, but so powerful and true. Forever, as long as I'm still able to and capable of enjoying whiskey and being healthy about it, Peter, but you're absolutely spot on. Actually, is saying Lager 16 continues to be an absolute favourite of, of mine too. Yes, there are better whiskies, but it's lovely in its own way. And yeah, it changes over time, of course, like all malt whiskies do, they do, they do up, ebb and flow a wee bit. But the amount of my friend, the amount of friends that I have that I've converted to whiskey through Lagavulin 16 is is incredible. Um, I've got one, I've got another wee Glen going to pour and share with you here. Rika Haddock spot me a drama as well, saying drop it in quickly. Good to see you back. Have a lag of 16 on me. <laughs> got a Glen going tour booked for mid-September, my first distillery tour. It was my first distillery tour, tour too, my friend. Uh, I hope you really uh, enjoy it. I hope they look after you as well as they normally look after me. Cheers to you and thanks for the dram. It's going to be crazy to a lot of people that I would pour this whiskey um, alongside a lag of villain. But I'm not in an analytical mode. I'm just in a flavour mode. I just want to enjoy the whiskey. So it's okay to go from something PT to something that's not PT. It's fine. If you were having a flight and you didn't want to contaminate your palate too much as you go through the flight, yeah, you need to keep an eye on the flavour profiles and you need to keep an eye on the ABVs. But I'm just relaxing with you guys tonight. So don't judge me. And actually is saying I grew up uh, trout fishing with my dad. Not sure I will be able to go uh, back to it now he's gone. Uh, it's going to be bittersweet for you, actually, isn't it? I can imagine. Um, I've actually gone trout fishing a couple of times with my son and caught nothing. My wife seems to pull them out uh, like they're jumping uh, onto the end of the line. Uh, she's clearly got a, a more of a knack than I have. Uh, my son thinks it's fun, but he, I don't think he particularly loves it. I think he's more into the idea. Anyway, roll forward to this bottle, not this exact bottle, but one of these, which just out of pure coincidence, is another bottle of Glengoyne. And 
it's from the gentleman who gave me uh, this jug, Simon, my friend Simon, for my 40th, he came up and he bought me this bottle of Glen Goyne 21 and gifted it to me for my 40th birthday. What a fabulous gift. Back then it was about £65, I remember, because the replacement bottle I bought, I did buy at the airport and I paid £65 for it. But I'd never spent that kind of money on whiskey before. Lagavulin in 16 back then was £40, £45 on special offer. And at Costco and places, you could get it sub £40. That was that was my premium treat. That was my high-end whiskey, Lagavulin in 16. So £65 for a bottle of Glen Goyne, that was a lot of money. It's funny how things change. Simon bought me this whiskey and we opened it at my 40th. And I realised that things had changed again. Oh no, now that I've tasted this, how can I go back and enjoy my Glen Goyne 10s and 12s? And how can I go back and enjoy my Glen Ferric 12s? How can I go back to things that are not 21 years old? Snapper XV has joined the Barflies as well. So, so amazing to see all of you um, and your support tonight. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Oh, and I was tasting the leather, I was tasting the dark fruit, I was tasting the Christmas cake, I was tasting the dunnage note, the age, the maturity of the whiskey, and I was tasting how softly and richly all of these things would be delivered. And I remember sipping it with non-whiskey drinkers, and the non-whiskey drinkers, everybody in a circle, silent at the marvel of what was in our glasses in front of us. It wouldn't have been Glen Cairns. We'd have been standing in a circle holding tumblers, of course. Absolutely fine. And it was significant. It was a shared experience. And I remember Simon and I just kind of having a glance and just thinking, aye, okay. <laughs> and again, that this, the, the ceiling had been moved. I knew that my journey was going to have to take me into uncomfortable territory and I was going to have to find a wee bit more money to afford this new fascination. Jean de la Cuisine is saying, first Isla that blew my mind was our big 10. I actually dropped a bottle on the pavement <gasps> right when I came out of the shop. It survived, so it must have been fate. Thank goodness for the strength of a sealed whiskey bottle, Jean. It doesn't always happen like that. Graham Fraser saying, I got Glen Goyne 21 at the distillery for £120 before the pandemic. Last week it was 149 I didn't notice that. A wee bit cheaper than that. I think it's about 140 with your discount ticket. But I, you're right. It, I think it's I think it's still about 120 online. Don't quote me. I'm not sure. If you come to Alaska at the end of July, Tom Elmer is saying, or the beginning of August, Silver Salmon will hook your son and maybe you. Also a good chance for otter viewing. The whiskey is on me, Tom. That might be something that I cash in one day. And I, laddie, is in saying, I'm off to sleep to be fresh for another day of Comfort con Congress. Oh, wow. Be well. Good to have you in, Rombo. I'm glad you were able to join us for a wee well, my friend. Nice to have you. And John Della Cuisine saying it, chipped a big chunk of glass out the bottom. Thank our beg for heavy bottomed bottles. Aye. Let's go in and read a wee notion of, because we're talking about these are big tens and we're talking about these big, heavy, peaty, bold, smoky Isla peat monsters. They should be really quite difficult and challenging, which I think they are, and that's half the attraction. The first Lefroy says Frank Peat Head, um, who I was with on Sunday, was the quarter cast for him. And he says it was described as a punch in the face too. Too outstanding, not drinkable, etc. But I loved it, says Frank. It marked my love for peated whiskey. Now that he calls himself Pete Head, it seems to have done the trick, Frank. Then he went on to something quite seismic. It was Ardbeg. 1815. Yep, way too expensive. And he's saying, for the record, it was well into the four digits and the first digit was not a one and not widely available. And I only got a sip but it was the start of a friendship that was and is worth more than that bottle. That strikes me, and that's an interesting thing, because we often, through sharing, 
through a sample, through a dram purchase, through a festival, through something, we're able to touch these whiskies that are unicorns or super rare or super expensive. We sip these things knowing full well that we cannot afford the experience that the rest of the bottle could bring. But it hooks us and it grabs us and it pulls us in and realizes that this journey is endless. It makes us understand that it's endless. That we can chase these flavors, these experiences, these things, and they are, they continue to be genu genuinely unique. Marcel is saying, I am not even very aware of how the stickers go on or off, eh, but I did like to buy you a dram. <laughs> Thank you, Marcel. And Ronald is saying, Glen going 21 online at their own online shop is 170. Glen going 21, 170. Matt has seen your live stream with Ralph. It was my favorite whiskey stream in a long time. You guys should do many more in the future as a regular collaboration. Cheers. I think it's nice to see um, Ralphie doing that. I think it's nice to see Ralphie step out of the bothy from time to time. And he knows that he's welcome here whenever he wants to turn up and hang out with everyone. But with everything around Ralphie, he calls it and he does it at his pace and how he wants to do it. And that's just the agreement I've always had with him. If he thinks that he's in the mood to come on again in the future, my friend, eh, I'll be the first to reach out to him and welcome him on once more. Matt, thank you very much for the dram. Cheers, and I'm glad you enjoyed hanging out with us last week. despite the Ralphie effect audio issues that we had. So thanks for that, Frank. And thank you for a, that particular epiphany, my friend Simon. And I've been chasing prices ever since. But the 65, the 70, the 75 pounds, this new ceiling I had, to go to that level was still treat whiskey. This was like birthday, Father's Day, Christmas type whiskies. That was my price ceiling. But we end up in a flavor chase, don't we? We end up pushing that envelope. We end up going to see where the next thing is going to light up all our senses, like those previous epiphanies did. And as we chase these things, sometimes it comes from unexpected places in unexpected ways. Um, Afat is saying, I think, ah, Apat, I, sorry about, uh, I'm, I know I'm butchering that handle there. Um, he's saying, I suspect Ralphie may slowly come round to streaming over time. Aye, he might, he might just enjoy it. He might get into a wee stride in a rhythm. And Helen is saying, it was great to see Frank behind the bar on Sunday. Helen, it was great to be here and hanging out with him as well. Um, and it was the first time I've done that in a long time. And I was comforted by how calming. I found that it was great to have, well, hanging out with all you guys as well, all the patrons. Ian Graham is saying, how much did the rev influence your increase in spending? Graham, <laughs> can you read my mind? Or have you been here for long enough to know what's coming next? So the rev and I did, we've done uh, things in the past where we've shared these stories in this journey. But truthfully, that unexpected element coming into it is really, that's the rev I'm talking about. We've got a local Church of Scotland minister here. Um, that I would have otherwise no business of getting to know or, or understanding anything about the man. But our wives were talking and friendly, and they worked out that both husbands enjoyed whiskey. I was to discover that the Rev enjoyed a little drop of Glenmorangie and a big drop of lemonade. That was how he was drinking his whiskey. But he was always whiskey curious, and he liked the idea of whiskey. He'd just never taken any action to do anything about it. I invited him round, we had a flight, a lineup, and he recalls the story now of when I was sharing my experiences with whiskey that it reminded him of hearing stories from his previous life as a policeman listening to addicts. I've always kind of uh, considered that feedback. Um, but regardless, he would, he would return, he would come back again and would enjoy another flight. And then he would start buying his own whiskies. And at that point, Ian, you're spot on. It became an arms race. And it became Whiskey Wednesday and he was around here. Uh, it, it was just the Rev and I, and occasionally there would be other guys as well. The most common uh, third member um, would have been 
malt mafioso Roberto, he would join us occasionally. But there'd be other people that would turn up and join us from time to time. But the Re the Rev and I would have almost all Wednesdays parked just for whiskey. This was a weekly occurrence, and we always managed to have new whiskey to try every week. So that tells you what we were buying. It wasn't always a bottle every time, but it was often samples. Now, I could have reached out to any amount of whiskies in my collection and any amount of memories that I have. Kininvies and Mortlack 16 from Flora and Fauna and uh, older whiskies and grain whiskies and um, re things that are long discontinued. And, and I could have, there could have been any amount. But there were certain whiskies that the Rev and I enjoyed that meant something to me that helped me understand whiskey better. And that's the ones I would like to focus on tonight. Jimmy Lag is saying he guesses he's not quite at the binnacle. No bottles of Brora in the house yet. But if you tried a Brora, it might not be your pinnacle, Jimmy. Graham Fraser is saying, I think the Batch 8 teapot dram might be another 10 to 20 pounds on top. There was a bit of a jump last time in price. It's no different from what's happening in whiskey generally. Of course, we understand. But when we're emotionally invested in things, it can affect us, definitely. Whiskey Whistle Mark is in. If Ralphie has got the upload speeds needed, which seems he's got now, I'm sure he'll start streaming, likely for his Pat Pals first. I don't doubt that at all. I, he's hinted at it. Um, I know that he's got the connection, Mark. You're absolutely right. You saw that he was coming in pretty clear from the Bothy. Um, uh, I hope that he does. That would be good to kind of hang out with Ralphie from time to time. And first of all, Whiskey is in as well. Good to see you, Phil. It's nice to welcome you both in here. Whiskey Whistle. Whiskey Whistle. First of all, Whiskey, uh, both content creators out there. And Whiskey Tube as well. Fantastic to have you in, guys. Um, and Jimmy, like I saying, I have tried a Brora or two. It is my pinnacle. <laughs> Aye, okay, Jimmy. It's, it's going to be tough. We need to stay alive and healthy for long enough to be able to perhaps engage with the Brora that may or may not be affordable that's being made right now as we speak. Yeah, because the stuff that was made up until 1983 is uh, way past uh, most of our reach now. Greg, I think we're saying today I paid 60 euro for the Glenturret 12 2020 maiden release. Uh, okay, it's about, in Germany there were, it was down at 48 for a while, 60 euro is okay. Gregor, I would love to know what you think about that. I absolutely loved it. Uh, Lee Jason, it's only been an hour and enjoyed every minute. This is how Thursday evening should be, but it's time for bed. Good night, all. Oh, cheers, Roy. I will definitely be watching the replay. Lee J, it's always wonderful to welcome you in, my friend. I hope life down there in Wiltshire is treating you well. Tommy Elmer is saying the top of my list is Black Art, I think. 23 year old uh, Black Arts 4.1 was one of the richest, most complex whiskies I'd ever tried. That was a significant uh, whiskey. Was it an epiphany? Uh, it could be. It could be. Alistair McPhail is saying, sorry, Roy, got to go. Can't join you next week. It's our 32nd anniversary. I visit to Glengoyne that day and we'll be in Dune that night. Maybe you'll get to go quickly past Deanston as well, Alistair. Thanks for joining me tonight, my friend. Cheers to you. Oh, this is a lag of villain. Thanks very much for your drama, Alistair, and I hope your anniversary goes very, very well. So we're chasing flavour, and I will say, I will hold up to you the probably two of the most significant bottles. One of them is sealed, and I won't be opening this tonight, but the other one has been sealed far too long, and it will be getting open tonight. Uh, this is Klein Leash. The Whiskey Rev went out and bought this on a whim, this very cask number. This uh, He paid £89 for it. I paid significantly more than that for this. Yeah, I bought this in 2019. Uh, one came up for sale. It's very, very rare to find it now. Cask 8687 now. There's only ever 600 bottles of this, but I found one and I bought it. This is 1990s Klein Leash, but this is not a celebrated Klein Leash, let's say, or, or what used to be not very celebrated because it's from a sherry cask and people used to talk about Klein Leash did its very, very best work in a refill a bourbon cask, ex-bourbon or distillery would refill wood. However, this is refill, sherry butt, and this is completely transformative whiskey for me. It taught me about tasting fruit. It taught me about tasting um, things that were difficult for me to um, articulate. 
little did I know it was that waxy element. It was leading me into thinking about whiskey as more than just smell, aromas and flavour, but actually thinking about texture and whiskey. This was sublime and sumptuous. There are lots of issue, uh, uh, signatory Klein leashes out there. They're way beyond affordable now. It's very, very expensive to get a hold of. Look elsewhere for your Klein leash experiences now. But this was significant. I hadn't even been through my second sip from the glass. The Whiskey Rev recalls the story as well, and I had been online and bought a bottle for myself too. And the Whiskey Rev and I have been through significant amounts of these since then. Yeah, this has been bottled back in March 2016, and I think that would have been about that time. It would have been the middle of that year, 2016, when I really started to understand what people were talking about when they talked about this waxiness, when they talked about texture. Um, absolutely enlightening, fantastic stuff. So we're getting closer to these whiskies that teach us about subtlety and how it doesn't always need to be this big flavour bomb, impactful, knock the lights out type thing. This thing taught me how to consider whiskey that was quiet and complex and somehow really, really seductive. This is long discontinued, I'm afraid. None of the bottles I'm sharing tonight, I hope, is going to give anybody FOMO. It's not the kind of thing you can go out and, and buy easily. But the styles and the profile of the whiskey, I hope you can relate to and I hope you might be able to track down yourself. The reason this is unique in Anox lineup and the reason I hope that they bring it back again is this is the only one that is exclusively ex-bourbon and it's at that magical age that perfect age of, for scotch is, is mid-teens, in this particular case, 16 years old. Exclusively ex-bourbon. It says unchill filtered on the label. They've now recently increased the labeling, so they will also put a, a natural color on the label now, Anok, but back then they only wrote unchill filtered. This, and it's about time too, is getting uncorked tonight before I read you another wee story. Chris Pollock is saying that bottle was my first Anok. It was only about £50, Chris. I think you might recall it wasn't too expensive. Hoyt is saying any independent bottler selling Klein Leash now, absolutely. You can still get it uh, from Indies. Uh, obviously, the 14-year-old is still hovering around the £50, £55 mark um, from Diageo, the 14-year-old, 46%. Uh, but you can get lots of independent bottling Klein Leaks. Not all ways labelled as Klein Leash, sometimes it's just Highland malt. Ronald is sharing uh, some uh, current Glen Goyne prices, including the 50-year-old, £22,500. Wow. I think they've only got one bottle of it left, so you need to be quick, Ronald. It's been a long time coming. This wee Anok. See if we can get a nice... This is when I first started to develop what is still, arguably, my favoured whisky style. I love sherry matured whiskies. I love uh, vatted of various casks. I love all whiskies, honestly. If they're good, I love them. But this... The, the idea that it's just the cask is here. So I imagine some of that very, very light coconutty and tropical, very light creamy pineapple, all that white stone fruit. Maybe all of that is coming from the cask, but the cask is quiet here. There's still lots of lovely, clean, fresh spirit. Now, what I'm looking for here is that mineralic thing, that, that thing that I first discovered in this whiskey that I couldn't articulate easily at the time. And what I've come to understand is a kind of chalk, it's not chalky because chalky suggests powdery or, or granular. It's not, it's more like a pebbly, like a stone, like a slate or granite or sometimes slightly medicinal, like a soluble tablet. 
because I'm looking for it, it is here. But as I know the glass right now, it's overwhelmingly white peach stone fruit. Light honeydew melon. Even some, the malt is very quiet, very soft. It's like a biscuit, quiet. Dried hay. Cheers, everyone. Absolutely fantastic. Every core range should have this style of whiskey in the lineup. And okay, maybe not Glen Goyne because they're known for cherry cast maturation and Glen Farkless and Aberlour and Tamdu and so many others. But to have something as clean and complex and delicious and Moorish and fruity and ex bourbon cask maturation for enough time to get that balance between spirit and cask and environment or time or whatever other magic is happening there in the alchemy of it all. This 16 years old, it's just perfect. This is not going to give you Campbelltown intensity and hits. It's not going to give you uh, old school funk. It's not going to give you big, rich, bold, amped up to 11 flavors. This is going to just be ever so delicate. It's going to ask for your attention in a different way. And it is just so, so enjoyable for it. Think, think of some of the lighter Aaron's. Think of light ex bourbon Longmorn. Think Glen Lossie. Think light Glen Cadam. That's the style of whiskey that we have in the glass here. And I miss this whiskey so. For their 125th anniversary, they put out a higher ABV, a cast strength version of this. It was expensive though, it was a hundred and something pounds. Um, this was about half that price. Marcel Beermeister is saying, oh, oh my God, that is a whole other chapter. Okay, we've got some uh, we've got some uh, spam bots and again looks like they've been deleted. Uh, thank you very, very much. Steve A. Steve A is in. Yeah, I noticed that Sugar Kitty has also got moderator status as well. <laughs> I remember what happened when Ralphie was in. Uh, sorry to saddle you with that. I hope you're okay with it. Ian Graham is saying, how does Glen Geary compare with Anok and Ardmore? I haven't had the chance to try it yet, but I suspect I'd really enjoy it. Yeah, I would say that, that uh, Glen Geary is, is a bigger, bolder, heavier thing. Um, I think if, if you speak to anybody that's been into whiskey for long enough, they lament the days of Glen Geary when it was peated. And I understand that Glen Geary is moving back to that style again. Um, would I, is anything similar to Ardmore? Not really in my mind. Uh, they're both... Uh, very similar in terms of locale and of course that's probably why you're asking I guess Ian that Anok is too but Anok no, Anok is more a kind of uh, lighter fruitier style more minerally whereas Ardmore obviously there's it's that peated a uh, quite nicely peated oftentimes I think Ardmore was one of the best values uh, in Highland whiskey out there in terms of peated style of Highland whiskey I think it's great you can get loads of it from Indies uh, independent uh, bottlings are where the majority of the fun's going to be had with it, but they still have a, an occasional um, official bottling as well. Remember the 20 year old that came out a couple of years ago, fantastic value too. Um, and it's worthy of your time. I wouldn't say that they're very similar, but they're all worthy of exploration. Glengarry, for me, often does very well in an active or a bold cask, a, a nice sherry cask, for example. Um, Jimmy Legacy, like and I have half a sample of Anok 24 from Bud Jenkins. It is really good, and normally I like younger, higher ABV whiskies more. I think there's just enough going on in that glass of the 24 fantastic whiskey to keep you engaged. And actually, seeing Ardmore Port Cask is outstanding. A wee story here from a friend in Canada, Graham Young, and he takes us back to 30 years ago. 
He says, my cousins came for a visit at my parents' home. I would have been a beer-only drinker at the time, and my cousin's spouse had a Talisker 10, I believe, and he sat in the shade in a warm evening and waxed lyrical about the subtle smoke and long finish, the term mouthfeel, and he described it so well we had to try it. So this is Graham getting introduced to that texture thing. The mouthfeel for me said, spit that crap out, but I didn't. I waited, and something happened. The envelope of flavours and the slight burning when swallowed was all desirable and not awful as I expected it to be. Following that, I would accept a scotch when offered to me and several years later, a bottle of Highland Park 12 made it home with me and I've been a student of sensory expansion and exploration ever since. When I too found Ralphie's channel, I reviewed all my bottles with his back catalogue and have tried my best to record my taste experiences in a journal also. So there's Graham doing two things there. Obviously, he's got that guiding light. He's got somebody bringing him in, but he's been able to stick with it and, and get past that initial burn and that shock and be introduced to something that's not just aroma and flavour, but texture too. And then through him going online and connecting with Ralphie and sipping his whiskies with Ralphie's back catalogue, which I suspect is done by a lot more people, um, than would often admit it. I used to love doing that and I still do it of occasion today. You're just sitting on your own. You're having an experience with a glass. Type it into YouTube and sip along at the point where whoever it is is sipping. Tell me that it doesn't enhance your experience. You don't need to agree on all the notes. You don't need to agree on the appraisal of the score or anything else. We take pleasure and even the things that we disagree about in whiskey. But you might find that you end up agreeing with a lot of it. Fantastic stuff. Uh, lots more to share with you. But I'm very glad to have Anok 16 opened once more. I'm very happy to share a wee dram of this with someone leave a wee comment or something, anybody that comments on, on the, not in the live chat tonight, obviously, but something I can read afterwards if you comment under the video just now um, or after the event, eh, I'll pick eh, somebody that I know that it's safe to get it to legally, of course, eh, and I'll pour a wee dram so that I can share this Anok and try and get across uh, why this style of whiskey is just so lovely to me. It's just delicious. It's fantastic stuff. There's another bottle I'm going to uncork tonight. And it's another bottle that taught me about another uh, area of whiskey which, that I declared I do not like. I use the term again. And it's going to keep coming up. And Dominic Fife is saying, add more. Go for pre-2000s when the stills were coal-fired. And what's interesting, Dominic, is that you, when so many whiskies of the 1990s and older are becoming so expensive now, uh, you can still get, Ard it's not cheap by any means, but you can still get Ardmore of that age. Um, and it's not got quite, amongst whiskey geeks and people in the know, it has got a bit of cachet, but the general wider market don't really seem to chase Ardmore's quite as much. I've downloaded all of the 2009 and 2010 Ralphie videos so I can watch them anywhere I go. The original Ralphie back when he was in Glasgow, Jimmy. That's amazing. I hope he'd be chuffed to hear that. Fantastic. So there we go. I'm still continuing along this journey. I'm still going through. My mind is being opened. I'm exploring all of these amazing flavor flavors. I'm deeper and deeper and deeper into the whiskey rabbit hole. And I'm at a whiskey club night and I turn around and I see wine finished whiskies. I just don't like them. I don't like them. I don't like whiskey in a wine cask. And there was a discussion broke out at the table that Roy, it's not that you don't like whiskey a wine cask, what you don't like is certain whiskies and certain wine casks. If it's done well, it's lovely. Trust it. Try it. Stick with it. No, I just don't like it. I don't go on with it. Greg Benson was the guy that was there that night and specifically encouraged me to try a long row red. And it just so happened that there was a long row red behind the bar at the Bon Accord that night. I'm going back to 2016 or 2017 now, 2017, no, maybe 2016. And it was the Malbec expression. I've shared this story a few times. To the point that the Scotch Test Dummies bought and sent me 
I, it's over here. A bottle of that whiskey. And Jay, Jay Chung from the States, when he visited here, he came, he, we met up because he'd won a bottle of Aaron 14 from me that I had given away. But he met me and he had a bottle to give back to me in exchange. And it was this. Long Row Red. Malbec cask matured, 13 years. 51.3% ABV. So just because people hear how much I've connected with a bottle of whiskey, they end up gifting it to me because they can get a hold of it when I can't. Quite incredible generosity. So Scott and Bart specifically, and Jay Chung, eh, still a friend and patron. All of them still friends and patrons. Thank you so, so much. I'm gonna pour the whiskey that taught me how to enjoy whiskey that's been matured, or at least partially matured, in red wine casks. And I think the reason that this whiskey does that is because it's long roll, because of the weight, because of the spirit being bold enough, for it being heavy enough, for it to be meaty enough, savoury enough, smoky, all of these things, to deal with all the things that I don't particularly enjoy about red wine cask maturation, the overly kind of bitter tannic finish, the sharp tart fruits that are just a wee bit too shouty and, and jarring with the rest of the spirit at times. Sachin Kenth is in as well. Hi Roy, not been able to watch your live streams for a while. Glad to be here now. Sachin, it's good to have you in my friend. Hey, I've got a wee bottle here that was a gift from you as well. Uh, sitting on the backdrop, uh, a wee bottle of Heaven Hill that you gifted me as well. I remember it dearly, my friend. Nice to welcome you in. And Graham Fraser is saying there's a bottle of Anox 16 cast strength in the Amber Bar at the Scotch Whiskey Experience to Dram. You can buy it by the Dram. Fantastic. Um, uh, Whiskey Mystery saying Long Row Red 13 Malbec is still holding number 13 on our shelf. Thanks, Recycled Reviews. Now, number 13 on Phil and Deepa's shelf, I have to think, is pretty good scoring indeed. It's so rich. So that dry kind of uh, red current thing is here, but it's inviting and it's nice. You don't have the kind of, um, the, the immediately that kind of bitter tannic presentation that comes, it can sometimes come across a wee bit like fruity dark tea. And it's a wee bit like that here, smoky tea. <laughs> but so rich, lots of fruit. And just by the, the idea that it's long row red, yeah, I'm thinking about red fruit. There's maybe some kind of burnt orange. But I'm thinking mostly currants, black currants, forest fruits, berries, jam, smoked jam. Cheers. So 55.3% ABV fills, fills your head, fills your palate. So communicative, so vibrant, so alive. Pete is way in the background. This is long row. This is, it's got that funk. It's got the Campbelltown. It's got the body. It's got the, the weight to it, the heft. And it remains through it all fruity. It's jammy. It is like fruity tea. It's, it's got it's got that nice texture, that effervescence, that fizz, that thing that we love about Campbelltown. It's unique. And I've barely mentioned the smoke. And I've barely mentioned bitter tannins either. There is dryness there, there is bitterness, but the finish is ridiculously long. Still there. 
Whiskey Wookie is in. That looks like a new name. Whiskey Wookie, nice to welcome you here. He's saying this Malbec, Malbec Long Row was the first bottle I truly chased. I never found it, but did find others, and I've loved every one of them, but they are difficult to find in the States. Depends where you are. When I was over in the States, Whiskey Wookie, I was in Texas, and they had multiple editions of a Long Row Red just sitting on the shelf. I would have brought it home, seriously, that it was the same for Springbank local barley when I was over in Texas. They just had them on the open shelf. Um, but obviously you're limited to how much luggage you can bring back. They were a wee bit expensive. They were a bit more expensive than we were paying here for them, up closer to the $100 mark, if my memory serves me well. Um, but so rare are they here, and it's only getting worse for Springbank right across the board that you are... you. I feel your pain. That's all I'll say, Whiskey Wookie. I feel your pain. Graham Fraser is saying, I've been a bit ambivalent towards wine finishes since Glenmorangie days. Some are tasty, some overpower the distillate. Glenmorangie is such a delicate spirit in comparison to something like Long Row or Glen Scotia, who have also been very successful with wine finishes. Buna Havens, um, it, it, the peated Buna Havens, um, so many, it just I think the spirit needs to have a bit more aggression or a bit more character or weight or heft about it to deal with too much time in, in a red wine cask. I'm wary of it as well, Graham. I am wary of it, and I'm wary of it when it's a light whiskey from a red wine cask. I'm probably not going to love it too much. Let's have a wee story from my friend John Bell over in the States. John says, for me, it started when I started dating my wife about 21 years ago. I had to drink some Glenlivet 12 with her father as not to lose any points. I was not a fan right away and looked as a, at it as a chore. However, at some point, a switch flipped and I started to enjoy it. Still, I was lumbered, I lumbered on with scotch drinking for years without too much thought as to what I was choosing. The first gr to grab my attention was Laphroaig. I went back to it frequently, then came Oban, Scapa, and Lagavulin. I finally reached a point where I wanted to continue exploring new scotch, but I had no idea where to start while also thinking that spending $60 on a bottle was ridiculous. I hatched a plan to start a scotch club in 2015 and to try to build up funds for expensive bottles. Unexpectedly, at the first meeting, I was struck by something dif different. We tried a semi-blind taste test, and I can still remember that moment in my kitchen when I became infatuated. I was quickly obsessed and fascinated with blind tasting. Eventually, I started looking on YouTube to see if other people were doing these, and I found really only one. Of course, it was Roy, specifically the one with Scott from the Scotch Test Dummies. Since then, I've, been taste I've tasted amazing whiskey at all prices and met a benevolent a benevolent a group of individuals and my journey continues. So we see this thing where he's been so struck by flavour that he's actively gone out and started a club. Now it may be that he wants to reduce the cost and amortise the cost over bottles sharing it with friends, but that's a marvellous idea, isn't it? Anybody that wants to start their own club, I've said it multiple times, please, if I can help you, I'll be very, very happy to help you. But he's gone out there and been driven to do that very thing because he wants to experience more things. $65 is a ceiling at the time. I guarantee you, John, that your ceiling is as higher than that now. And I hope that the journey ahead is every bit as exciting as the one you've experienced up to now. And thank you for discovering me, whether it was through blind tasting or otherwise. Uh, good to see Che Francis in as well. Che, I hope uh, you're enjoying your time up at the... Uh, uh, um, Tindrum in the Green Welly shop. Fantastic. Thomas Elmer saying, yes, any peated in port or red wine is a wonder. Yes. So peat, peated whiskey seem to work quite well. Whiskey games, Deanston Bordeaux finishes lovely. That That's an interesting one. It, and it, is, it doesn't seem like it should work, and yet that does. And, and I've often wondered how that was a 2008 release. I think they released it in 20... 17 or 2018, I'm not sure, Matthew, from memory. But they've since brought out that same whiskey as a 10-year-old using the, the casks, I think, as a finish. Um, but the original Cast Strength 2008 version was wonderfully bright, alive and fruity um, in a way for you to realise that Deanston, despite being a slightly 
lighter flavour malt whisky can do very, very well, even in a red wine cask. Sandy McDonald's bought me a wee dram. Sandy, you've not left any comment or anything. You've just bought me a wee whisky, my friend. Uh, it's very, very nice of you to do so. Thanks very much. Cheers. I'll try and pick up a comment if you did mean to uh, say or ask something. Cheers, Sandy. I'll give you a wee heads up on what's happening in the month ahead. It's more or less carved out. Um, next week, we're going to do a deep dive into untangling the mess and confusing mess that is Japanese whiskey. I've reached out to my friend Mac at Canpai Planet, who's going to come on and talk to us about, is there anything worth looking at a Japanese whiskey now? Is it actually Japanese whiskey or is it something else? What is the definitions and what is happening in Japanese whiskey? And why is it over the years, as I've expanded my whiskey collection like I have, the Japanese whiskey that I have on the shelf is less and less to the point that I only have two bottles here now. Is there anything I'm missing? I don't think so, honestly. But Mac is going to lead us through the, and untangle the mess that is Japanese whiskey. And we're going to, I'm going to enjoy hanging out with a Mac a wee bit next week. The week after that is an interesting one. We're traveling up to the Western Highlands and we're going to try another one of these remote V pubs. We're going to be coming to you live from Ardnamurchan as well, up there on the Ardnamurchan Peninsula. Very, very interesting. It'd be fantastic if we could pull that off. Well, I'm looking forward to going up there. I have not visited Ardnamurchan yet. Uh, the week after that is another session with me and then at the end of the month in September, five V-pubs in September, it's a busy wee month, uh, we're welcoming uh, Rachel McNeil from the Isla Whiskey Academy to talk about education in Scotch whiskey and Rachel has some fantastic insight and some uh, interesting opinions about the landscape, how it's represented and how it's taught. She's a fascinating Tour de Force in Whiskey, a fascinating woman, and I'm looking forward to welcoming Rachel at the end of the month. That's September for you. I hope that there's some things in there to keep you interested and keep you, uh, I encourage you to come and hang out with me, please, on occasional Thursday evenings. So I've now got five whiskies in front of me here. Small pours, but there's plenty to be getting on with throughout the rest of tonight and uh, afterwards when I go and do all those wee chapter markers and everything for everyone. There is a quiz at the end tonight, of course there always is. I think I've tried to wind things back a wee bit, trying to make most of the questions accessible again. Um, we, we, we have got to a point that the quizzes are becoming more and more crunchy and tricky. It hopefully there's going to be some interesting questions in there and you'll feel like some of you have a chance of getting quite a good score tonight. Graham Fraser has bought me a wee dram to say a dram for you tonight, Roy. Thanks for the heads up with Tom and Anna at Clydesdale today. I hope, Graham, you had a fantastic time there. I thoroughly enjoyed my time with Tom. It's been a while since I've seen Anna. I hope you were able to pass on my regards, Tom, eh, Graham, and I hope you had a nice time eh, over at Clydeside. Eh, cheers to you, Graham. Thank you. Uh, Anok. Excellent stuff. And Jordi V's bought me a drama as well. A drama of Hibiki 21 in Japan took my journey to another level. Pure blending perfection, but the price of a bottle is just crazy. Jordi, you were fortunate back in the day to be able to try that and have that experience in the country itself, in Japan. Hibiki 21. Next week, we're going to do a deep dive into Japanese whiskey with Mac. Fantastic content coming out on that channel. Kanpai Planet on YouTube. What a high-end production, really engaging, really concise, punchy content that Max putting out there. I hope you go and have a wee look at Max's content as well, Jordy. But thank you for your drama, friend. Cheers. This long road's going down very well. I've got a few more uh, uh, wee stories to read out here, but I'm not going to get through them all. There is one or two that I, I most certainly want to share with you. Uh, I'll share, uh, before I share my final one with you, I'll share Alan's. Alan Liu uh, sent a wee message to talk about, again, how Ardbeg 10 was his 
thing that changed his relationship with whiskey. Our big ten is it completely shattered my dual ill-conceived perceptions that all scotch was peated and that peated scotch tasted on the bad end of fiery gasoline and petroleum. Indeed, our big ten was the most engaging whiskey I had had to that point. I started that journey with bourbon. I could not set it down. It contained aromas and flavours I'd never experienced before in a drink and I needed to understand it. Add in an Alexander Murray Glenlossy 19-year-old bottling that was my epiphany for 2020. Its development was long, ambling and nuanced, which I'd never experienced before that. It was the first bottling that, create, that crested the $100 marker for me and I've never looked back to the chagrin of my wallet, says Alan. So there's that theme that the flavour chase means that it, it seems to make us chase bottles and spend more money, more money than we would have other, otherwise considered even credible to spend on a bottle of alcohol. The other, the other interesting thing for Alan is the contrast. He's gone from that, that huge, powerful flavour from the Arbeg 10 to a really light, delicate, nuanced space cider, which is fascinating to me to be able to pick up that amount of pleasure from something delicate and nuanced. Is that Glen Lossy? It's the exact same thing. I can relate completely, Alan, because, you know, I'd gone through the flavour chase after discovering Malagavul in 16. I'd gone into all those big, rich, bold flavours. And it's things like Longmorn 16 and Anok 16 and these delicate things that grounds you again and realises that there's much more to it than big, shouty flavours. And Sachin eh, is saying, has bought me a wee dram to say, looking forward to the Oswiz. Absolutely. Listen, I think I, I was going to have a week and a questions and answers type session about the Oswiz. There's lots of questions out there. There's super positivity. People are really behind it and supportive. But there's lots of people kind of holding their hand up a wee bit and saying, here's a wee warning. Have you considered this? I think this will happen. I see this has been a problem. You've maybe not included these channels and everything. And I will cover that. I'm not sure when to squeeze it in or how to do it. But I think what you, everyone needs to do is watch this thing play out. Everything's happening in the background right now. The, the nominees list is 24 channels coming together to, to make these this final nominee list that will go out to the public. It's very robust and layered. And it's not just, you know, throw it at us. It's going to be refined. And we're going to put it back to them and say, look, here are the nominations. What's going to make it out? To the public vote for your the ones that you want to make out get out to the you can't vote for your own of course you can only vote for other people's nominations and go through that process of refinement when it goes out to the public vote that's the acid test that's when we'll actually see the engagement see how it's running see what the feedback's going to be such and, and i think that in time we will have to change and modify certain things refine it a little bit but right now, best intentions, we're feeling okay about it just now. If anybody's got any questions, go through the oswa.co.uk website. You can fill a form in. That'll either make it to me, it'll make it to Ralphie, it'll make it to one of the teams so we can respond and say, here's what's happening. Um, any suggestions that you have, whatever it may be. But you're also welcome to just ask me any questions here too. Uh, I want to, I did have one more a wee story that I wanted to share with you. But I'll save that one right till the end. It's for one of our barfly pals. My flavour chase from then went on through continuing loops of I don't like. I pretended that I was enjoying bourbon. And truthfully, it wasn't pretending. I did enjoy bourbon, but I didn't love it. And I would reach past it. I would never reach out and grab a bourbon and say, I'm just going to enjoy this bourbon tonight. No, it was because I had to drink a bourbon with somebody that liked it or I put it in a lineup with as a contrast and I drank it. And it was like that. And then a guy called Triple Cap, Walt, comes to the UK and he leaves me a sample of Jack Daniels, single barrel, barrel proof. High ABV bourbon, Jack Daniels. Scotch Test Dummies gift me this bottle. Now, I'll be honest with you, this is the second bottle they've gifted me. The first one, um, which was looked the exact same as this, but it was their original bottle of WOW, they gifted to me as well. 69.7% um, ABV or something. 
And these whiskies come along at a very, very similar time. And not long after that, maybe a few months, a year after that, 2018, uh, my friend Ross and Jill, my friends Ross and Jill from the States, Ross Mashburn, he's often in, buys me this. This is a store pick. It says nine-year-old on the label, but up here on the badge, it's actually a 14-year-old store pick. This is 120 proof. The Elijah Craig, like I said, 69.7% ABV. The Jack Daniels single barrel barrel proof, a way up 60% or plus ABV. Really powerful whiskies. And oh my goodness, my world's changed. My perception of bourbon's changed. The intensity of flavor, the impact. Yes, they were oaky, but they were alive and oaky. They were vibrant and shouty and everything was there. Everything you could expect, everything to connect every single nerve that you had in your body and wire it directly to the receptors in your brain. It was fascinating. And I realized what bourbon had to offer. And that actually helped me bizarrely enjoy bourbon flavors at lower ABV. It shouldn't necessarily work like that, but it did work like that for me. Again, I was taught to not ever say I don't like. I have just not learned how to like yet. Maybe you can relate to that. Maybe you're coming from scotch to bourbon or bourbon to scotch or you're somewhere in between or it's happened with some other whiskey categories for you. But it just needs the right moment and the right time for you to realise that whiskey and the pursuit of flavour is endless. And we really don't know where it'll take us. Maybe one day you'll find yourself sitting behind some lights in a spare room in your house with loads of whiskey dripping from the shelves and find yourself feeling privileged that you can hang out with other whiskey folk from right across the world and just enjoy what whiskey's taught us to like. Hope everybody's interested in hanging out with me for a little while for the quiz. How are we doing for time tonight? We're doing okay. We might actually be able to keep it back to the old days of, uh, you know, um, the V pub where I used to target getting it under two hours. Those days have long since gone. And I'm not trying to meet a two hour target or anything. Please relax. If you're enjoying yourself, stay here with me for as long as you like. But there will be a quiz at the end in just a wee bit. Andrew Hamaker is saying bourbons, despite the legal constraints in production, can be very complex in its cast strength bottlings, especially Booker's and Balconis. I have to say, Balconis is here. If I wanted to talk about Balconis, Andrew, it was going to get talked about. The Booker's that I had, was, which was a gift from Whiskey Mystery Channel, uh, Phil and Deepa, brought me a Booker's across. Fantastic. Fantastic and delicate and not as powerful and, and intense and as as shouty as some of the bourbons I've spoken of already. Much more nuanced and quiet. A lot like the Elmer T. Lee I have over there from Tom Elmer who gifted me that. That's such a delicate, nuanced bourbon. You almost have to be careful how you pour that in a lineup. Because the delicacy of it, that very light kind of ginger and nutmeg spice that the Elmer T. Lee brings in, can easily be saturated or drowned out by an anesthetized palate after you've come off of a super intense, close to 70% ABV Elijah Craig Barrel Proof, for example. So there you go. Tom is saying, from your lips to God's ear. <laughs> he's, uh, he's just commented as I was speaking there. Superb. Everyone is saying, our tastes do change over time. Many things I disliked as a child, I now like or at least tolerate. Why wouldn't whiskey be the same? Exactly that. We've kind of got to just kind of go with it and just say, okay, I don't like it now. I understand other people are getting a lot out of this, so I'll try it again in the future. It's very, very true for styles of whiskey. Balconis, I've got a couple of these uh, uh, malt or single malt Balconis. The Mirador is, is fantastic. I've really enjoyed my time with that. There's not much of it left. Even the brimstone that's there is a flavour experience. It's wonderful. And if you're in the mood for something compelling like that, there's not much to touch that here. I have nothing that comes close to... It's still whiskey to me. It's a different take on whiskey, absolutely, to, uh, Balconis brimstone. But wonderful for it. Honestly wonderful. Stag Junior is not delicate or nuanced. 
McGregor, it's here and it's from you. Again, one of my special treats that I reach to only of occasion. And the ABV on this, 63.95%, almost 64% ABV. Fabulously rich and powerful stuff. And it teaches you that the entire whiskey category that you've been ignoring has so much more to offer than what you'd assumed from your supermarket experiences, from your pours, out at bars or whatever it might have been. 40% Buffalo Trace that we suffer in the UK, which is unforgivable, honestly. But these, these tell us, especially the Balconis things that gives you that contrast where you can get this whole complete different take on, yes, bourbons, but also malt whiskey from elsewhere in America too. It's endless. We just need to continue enjoying these experiences and bouncing off of these different whiskies to, so that it changes that journey ahead and continue sharing it when you've had an experience that you've really really loved grab your nearest whiskey friend and tell them about it share it with them first of all whiskey is fine i feel like that with rum i'm really keen to get some great sipping rums that are not just for mixing and starting a collection absolutely phil not only that that idea that you know i've got one or two rums here um, the Four Square Nobiliary is super intense and flavorful and really, really fantastic. I would recommend it to any whiskey drinker, honestly. But rums still can be challengingly sweet, I think, if you have a palate that's been refined on whiskey. Jimmy, you know I mean? like I said, pot still bourbon can be great, but I don't understand how people differentiate from all of the column still bourbon. It seems similar to me, unless there's a lot of rye in the mash bill. I, I bet you it's a lot like you and Campbellton whiskeys, Jimmy, that um, a lot of people that hadn't weren't used to drinking Campbellton whiskies would just taste the funk and they wouldn't really taste much beyond that. Our, our palates really need a lot of kind of compare and contrast um, and, and refinement over time in order to pick out the differences. I am not there yet with bourbon of any kind of bourbon. Cressamira is saying, even Roy, evening Roy and all the bar flies late tune in due to work. Good to have you in, Sniper King. Cressamira, I hope you're keeping very, very well. It's wonderful to welcome you here. And everyone is saying, would you consider yourself a whiskey explorer or a whiskey favourites drinker? Without question, both. <laughs> I am absolutely an explorer. I will continue to try all whiskey even if it's just to reassure me that my whiskey favourites that I'm enjoying is the right path, if that makes any sense. J. Francis Sane picked up a bottle of Balcones single malt. Fantastic stuff. Mine's a UK version, so no mention of uh, whiskey on it. Ah, okay. Well, um, that's what happens. I don't know about this. Uh, the, uh, the brimstone, I don't think, says whiskey on it. This one does say whiskey on it, but I did. This is a 750ml bottle I brought back from the States, or it was gifted to me, actually. This is from my friend Bill. Um, and I've only just recently, I think this was opened on a recent VPUB, actually, this particular one. Fantastic. Sid Martin is in, evening Roy, and one and all, just in time for the quiz. You are, Sid. You absolutely are. But before that, I'm going to read out a, a, a wee final story. And, and I'm sorry, I've got more stories here that I intended to read, um, but I knew that I was only going to get through a few of them. But I'm going to read out this one from our favourite barfly, a, from a, a gentleman that I know is his initials are B C, but we know him as Jimmy Leg. And Jimmy says he spent all of his younger years drinking beer at a pub called Maxwell's Plum. I loved Newcastle Brown, says Jimmy. One day in the mid eighties, my favourite bartender said, "I bet you'll love this," and poured something into a brandy snifter. It was Macallan Twelve, and he was right. I went along drinking Mac 12 when I could afford it and JW Black when I couldn't. Then one day I found Ralphie and everything changed. I was just amazed that he could find so many aromas and flavours in whiskey. Once I started finding them, too, there was no turning back. Now I'm here and where will whiskey take me next? I can't wait to find out. Jimmy, what a sentiment. Fantastic. I would have to say that 16 years in now, I don't know where my journey is going to take me either, buddy. I really don't. But it doesn't matter if I hold up this glass of Anok or this glass of Longrow or this glass of Lagavulin or 
What's the other one I have here? The Glengoin 21. Look at how much liquid is in that glass. It is absolutely stunning, the amount of flavours and experiences and complexities that can happen in that tiny little tablespoon of liquid. I know that I sound like that addict that the Whiskey Rev was suspicious of eight years or so ago. I know that. I know how I sound like a crazy man. But listen, I'm in a nice little comfortable echo chamber right now. I'm preaching to the choir. I'm sure you guys can relate exactly to what I'm talking about. It's endless, the flavour, the experiences, the decisions that you will make about actions that you take, travel plans that you have, things that you choose to spend your money on. Whiskey, when enjoyed the way we do responsibly and in a sharing way and in a positive way, has the ability to change life trajectories. And in extreme circumstances, it can take somebody who declares, I don't like, and place him a few years, a few years down the line in front of a camera and studio lights and a mic talking to people across the world about how fabulous a drink it is. Jimmy and everyone there, wherever your whiskey journey takes you in the years and the months ahead, I hope it's positive. And I hope, if I'm lucky, that some of that time is spent with me. Cheers, everyone. Slanchi Thank you all for your stories, your paragraphs, your emails, your direct messages. Uh, Jens Roger Christofferson, who's some of the other ones I've not been able to, to read out here tonight. I've not got as far. I, I read, I did read out Brian's. Christopher Booth's is here. I didn't get to. Matt Bishop's is here. Menno over in Belgium. There were so many more that I wanted to share with you tonight, uh, but I'll maybe do a wee copy and paste or something inside Patreon. In fact, if you're inside Patreon, most of these have already been shared in there, and you'll see uh, the, some of the stories that were put in there. Some of the direct messages and emails, maybe not. Jimmy, like I said, being in love with whiskey has really enriched my entire life. I'm sure it's the same with many of us. Absolutely, Jimmy. And Chris Pollock is saying, hopefully we can taste all the Turavex, Ardemurkins and Delmonics. Listen, we all need to survive long enough to be able to taste mature Turavex, Ardemurkins and Delmonics. I'm right there with you, Chris. Let's work on that. And Amy is saying, indeed, Aquavite, my family think of me a bit daft with all these bottles. I have to reassure them regularly that there's really not an issue with consum consumption. People walk into my house, people see the backdrop here, people see what's going on, and they say, oh my goodness, you've got a problem. And I say, yeah, I do have a problem. I over-accumulate whiskey for sure. And they say, oh, but drinking problem. And I said, listen, if I had a drinking problem, I wouldn't be able to accumulate the whiskey. Um, that said, let's not be dismissive. It's still a very, very powerful thing. It's a powerful drug. We do need to always uh, take fire breaks and checks and be careful that it's uh, us that stays in charge. Everwind is saying, I must say, with great sincerity, whiskey has brought me so many friends, virtual and otherwise, that my life has been so enriched. I could not have imagined sharing a dram so many years ago. Absolutely true, Chris. I'm right there with you. Jolly Rover is saying, 1990s JW Red, I hate whiskey. 2006, uh, LV16 at 4 a.m. at a company Christmas party. Wait a minute, what is this? 2007 to 2019, I like whiskey somehow. And that's right, that's right. It's just, it's the, it's the timing. And I think a lot of it's to do with maturity. Not necessarily a certain age, but just when your particular personal palate is ready for it. And he's saying, 2020 stumbled upon the Aquavite channel in a bored Corona lockdown night. The rest is history. Thanks for everything, Roy and Barflies. Loving every story by everyone. Jolly Rover. Thank you so, so much for your positive feedback. Thank you all for your likes as well. Thank you for commenting after the video. I'm very, very behind on comments, but I'm going to keep up with the promise that I made to everyone for 2021 that I'll reply to every VPUB comment that I can in the week following. 
I'm behind and delinquent on the very, very busy live stream from Ralphie last week. And I'm certainly behind because of the amount of comments that come in on the Recycled Review. Thank you all for your amazing positive feedback on it. I will go in there and I will respond to your comments and I will respond to the comments here on the VPUB as well. Perhaps Friday tomorrow, I'll get a nice window of time to do some catching up for all of you guys who take the time out to feedback to me. And Sachin is saying, I remember that you mentioning this, I was a lifelong teetotaler, tea, teetotaler until two years ago. I hope, Sachin, that that's a positive thing that you've discovered there. Anyway, thank you all for hanging out with me. Thank you all for everybody that contributed to the stories and the storytelling tonight. I hope that your whiskey journey up until now has been positive and continues to be positive going forward. I am going to pull up our quiz at the end for this evening and uh, suggest that you all have a chance of a strong pass mark tonight. I suspect that some of you might even have a wee chance of sneaking a 10 out of 10. I'll hold my fingers crossed for you. Let's see how we got on. Good luck, everybody. If you've been here for the quiz before, you know the drill. It's multiple choice. All the questions are multiple choice. So even if you guess you've got a good chance, the pass mark is a lowly 50%. Some of the questions are crunchy. However, they are intended that we all learn something from it. So even the banana skins and the ass hat questions are designed that it makes us think or understand something more about whiskey. You don't need to share your score with everyone. You can keep it to yourself. I will try and read out some of the scores if you do want to share it with me. Good luck, everybody. Let's roll on in to question one. Which of these distilleries can still be purchased as part of Diageo's Flora and Fauna series? That is, it's still being produced just now. I know you can purchase them all. Everything's just a question of price. But what, what is still being released today as a contemporary Flora and Fauna? Still available. A, Klein Leash. B, Glen Spey. C, Altmore. Which of those Flora and Fauna bottlings I can tell you just now that all three have made it into glass as a flora and fauna bottling. But I want to know which one can we still buy today? I've actually been drinking it recently. It's nothing spectacular. It doesn't stand out in any particular way, if I'm honest, but it's enjoyable. I think I should have maybe had a wee banana skin here. The Anok is just delicious. It's just delicious. I'm so happy to have it. So happy to have it open again. I came by that because of my friend Doc, McAllen Fine and Rare in Germany. Uh, he was able to source that bottle for me and I picked it up a couple of years ago when I was over. Dogs of No Uncles is changing to be misread C as a thrusk for some reason. A thrusk you can still buy. Altmore was once. A flora and fauna bottling is no longer available, and neither is Klein Leash. Klein Leash is part of the extended classic malts from Diageo. The 14 year old is not a flora and fauna any longer. It got a bump from 43% to 46% when it was released as an extended classic malts. Back in flora and fauna days, it was 43%. But the one that you can still buy today is B. Glen Spey. So if you answered B, you gave yourself a point. And Graham Fraser's saying, and I don't doubt this for a second, Graham, he's got bottles of all three. And Whiskey Radar is saying, not the Spayburn. Unfortunately, Roland, I don't have the Spayburn. <laughs> if anybody's got a Flora and Fauna Spayburn, do not open it. <laughs> Question two, who has released a second edition of a higher ABV? First welcomed in 2020. So what we're looking for here is a, a new edition. This is the second edition that's come out of this series. The first one we came out in 2020. This is a higher ABV edition and we're very welcome to have it. Is it A, Ben Romack, B, Glen Goyne, or C, Highland Park? Maybe a wee bit of a banana skin again. You have to consider that the first release of this higher ABV from this distillery came out in 2020. It's just been announced that it was successful enough for them to follow up with another release. A wee bit dubious about the price on it, but honestly, it's good that it's there as an official bottling. James Morgan is absolutely right. Whiskey Games is absolutely right. Odd Johan Lundberg, absolutely everybody has just announced that after the 2020 success of their cask strength release, 
Highland Park have released a second edition. Now, of course, Glen Goyne have their cast strength. They've had it for a long time, and they have Teapot Dram. They also have Chapter 2 of The Legacy that's that's come out. Yeah, but the first Legacy came out in 2018 or 2019 or something. Um, uh, so that's not what was after. And Ben Romack have also got their, originally their 100, de their 100 Degrees Proof, and now known as their Batch Strength or Cast Strength version. But the answer was C, Highland Park. Question three. Maybe a wee bit of a banana skin, not sure. Which malt distillery is closest to the Fife town of Glenrothes? Which malt distillery is closest to the Fife town of Glenrothes? Is it A, Inchderney, B, Glenrothes, or C, Cameron Bridge? We'll stay quiet on this one. Nigel Beale, zero for two, great. Nigel, stick with it. Stick with it. We'll try and nurse you through. Precarious Dave is in. Good to see you, Dave. Wonderful to have you here. Warner, one glass man is here. Jed Smith, fantastic. Uh, Dancing Midges and Glenn, good to have you. Lindsay Holman is here too. Uh, Rusty is in. That looks like a new name, Rusty. You're welcome here. Nice to have you. Peter Lee is here. Yongo is here as well. Fantastic. Um, is this a double bluff, Aquavite? <laughs> Jimmy. Which malt distillery is closest to the Fife town of Glenrothes? Nick Gascoigne has answered C. So is Jens Roger Christofferson. Guys, you have to be careful. I've specifically asked which malt distillery, Cameron Bridge, is a grain distillery. Glenrothes is not in Fife. Fife is in the Lowlands. It's, Glenrothes is in Speyside. There is a town in the Lowlands in Fife called Glenrothes, and then the nearest distillery to it these days is in Sterney. Wee bit of a banana skin. If I've been horrible to you there, by all means, eh, you can spit and complain from the lounge. <laughs> Spirit Works, Tom. Tom's in. Good to see you, buddy. I enjoyed hanging out with you yesterday. Just got back from SNWS tasting. What have I missed? Eh? Just me sharing stories. Uh, and and uh, I hope not too much, Tom. I hope you had a really nice night. Question four. Which of these distilleries boasts three still rooms? Looking for a distillery that has three separate still rooms. Is it A, Kalila on Isla? B, Glenlivet in Speyside? Or C, Ilsa Bay in the Lowlands? Which of these distilleries boasts three separate still rooms? Lindsay Holman is saying, I didn't know this until I happened to be in Google Maps touring a few nights ago. Three out of three. Lindsay Holman is a strong performance alongside Jerry Miller as well. Well, yikes, barely got, got it in. Three out of three, superb. Three big ones, says Jimmy Legg. Fantastic, well done. Most of you, very, very knowledgeable folk. You always uh, never cease to impress. Absolutely spot on answering that the uh, distillery after its expansion, I think originally in 2010, uh, went from um, four pairs to an extra three to make seven. And then in 2018, extended and commissioned another, doubling in size, another seven pairs to 14 pairs of stills over three separate areas is Glen Levitt. Yeah, up until Glen Ferrick's expansion, yeah, they were by far the biggest malt distillery in Scotland with those uh, stills. Question five. This is actually the image that's been used for tonight's thumbnail. Yeah, that's uh, actually me driving that wee car down there. But I want to ask everybody, what distillery am I driving to along this wee single track road? Am I, uh, I'm clearly on Isla. Am I driving to A, Bunahaven, B, Kilhoman, or C, Ardbeg? Which distillery does that wee road take me to? Yongo has spotted it. He's saying Isla, absolutely. Jolly Rover is on one for four. Still plenty of time for you to catch up and get a wee pass, Mark. No problem, Jolly Rover. Dogs have no uncles as thinks it's Kilhoman. Nick Gascoigne thinks it's A. First Phil Whiskey thinks it's A. Two people think I'm heading up to Bunahaven. Alex Andrew is in as well. Doesn't seem to be exactly on the coast to be A. I can tell you all that this is the single track road to Mahir Bay. So you're heading along this road 
you're heading directly west to Colchomen. So anybody that answered uh, B, James Morgan is saying BBB unless there is water on the left. Peter Lee, Lee is also in. Fantastic. Peter, good to see you. He, he guessed it right with B. Absolutely. This is to call home and lots. Uh, Dancing Minji on five out of five. Jerry Miller on five out of five as well. And Andrew Butler on a five out of five too. Superb. Question six. Visiting Langatun Distillery would find you in which European country? I hope this is a fairly easy one for a lot of us. Where would, uh, and I hope I'm pronouncing that well, Langatun. Would you be in A, Germany? Would you be in B, the Netherlands? Or would you be in C, Switzerland? If you are visiting the Langatun Distillery, I think founded uh, certainly in recent times, pre-2010, I think. Um, I know this because they've recently released a 10-year-old. I think I picked up a wee news story that they'd released a 10-year-old. But I'm asking what country they are from, Langatun. An easy one for you all. Fantastic to have so many of you hanging out with me till the quiz at the end. I really do appreciate it. I wake up on a Friday morning always feeling very happy, having had a nice little hangout with you all. You're absolutely spot on. Kicked it out of the park. Everybody in, everyone in the lounge pretty much got that. Absolutely, Langatun is a Swiss distillery. You'd be in Switzerland. Question seven. Jack Daniels had a new release last month, and it was very interesting. It was the first what? Jack Daniels new release in August 2021 was the first what? A lime flavoured edition, B 50 CL bottling, or C age statement in 100 years? And Andrew Hamaker is saying no place I'd rather be. Fabulous. Do you think one day we'll ever have an actual live VPUB where the place is just full of folk? I wonder. Excuse me, how we could make that work. I would have some audio issues for sure. But it would be very nice to do it. I think it'd be interesting. Jack Daniels had a new release last month. It was the first A, lime flavoured edition. B, 50 seal bottling or C, age statement in 100 years. Absolutely kicked it out of the park again. Big news from Jack Daniels. They have released an age stated Tennessee whiskey. Their take on bourbon at 10 years old. I've got a wee picture of it here. It's their first age statement in 100 years, apparently. A 10-year-old Tennessee whiskey, Jack Daniels. Now, the fantastic thing here is that it's up at 48.5% ABV, I think, so it's got decent grip, hopefully, there. Not the watered-down Jack Daniels eh, that we get most of the time. I wonder how many of how much of this is going to be released. I imagine it's going to be in demand. I hope some of it makes over here something I would be fascinated to try. Good stuff. And yet another indicator how people are moving towards more premium spirits, more quality presentation. Nobody's going to be buying the 10-year-old and throwing Coca-Cola on the top of it, we hope. Um, I don't know about the pricing. I know it's going to be quite expensive. I've been told it's $70 in the States. If it makes over here at £70, I think it might be worth a punt, even although that's quite pricey still. Looks like interesting whiskey. Question eight. It's Barflies question. If you're a member of the Aquavitae Barflies a Facebook page, this you might be helped a little bit here. Which blended malt has just been released at 46% and a 12-year age statement? Now, there's lots of this blended malt out there, here, and here, there, and everywhere. It's not widely distributed to all the markets I appreciate, um, but it's they've got a new one out at 46% and 12-year age statement. Not too expensive, as I understand. Is it A, Big Pete? Is it B, Compass Box Spice Tree? Or is it C, Old Perth? Which of those three blended malt whiskies has just been released at 46% and a 12-year age statement? Raul G is saying it's Friday morning in Australia, but still great to hang out for the tail end of the VPUB and quiz. We'll rewatch with a dram later tonight. Thank you, Raul. Very welcome to be in here. Thank you for joining us. And good morning. Connor Smith is saying, I noticed the release that it was limited to the US, but it would be great to see in the UK. I, I was a wee bit nervous about that, that it would be in the States. And I don't, I'm not sure I'm going to actually make it to the States. Uh, it hangs in the balance because of the COVID restrictions. We'll need to wait and see. Jonathan Flowers is in as well. Fantastic. Good to see you. This is uh, seems to be most folk thinking it's C for old P. 
Perth. And Warner is saying one glass man, see, based on popularity. Absolutely, it is the old Perth blended malt whiskey uh, from Carnmore, I think is the owner of the old Perth branding now. Uh, blended malt whiskey, usually great value, often quite interesting whiskies. Um, usually a decent presentation as well, but for them to have like something that resembles a, more of a core range product of 46%, hopefully it's reasonable price when it comes out. 12 year age statement is indeed old Perth. Second from last, around 18 Scotch malt distilleries use warm tub condensation, but which of these uses both? So we're looking for a distillery that uses shell and tube condensers as well as warm tub condensation. Which distillery is unique in that it uses both? A, Nocdu, otherwise known as Anok, B, Glenord, otherwise branded as the Singleton, or C, Glengyle, otherwise branded as Kilcarran. Which of those distilleries, out of all the warm tub distilleries in Scotland, has warm tubs as well as shell and tube condensers? Jonathan, uh, there may be a 12 year old Big Pete at 46%. Um, I'm speaking about a release, a, a very, very recent, just released, who has just released, a which of uh, them have just released a 12 year old at 46%. Tweetly saying, hmm, Springbank uses both as well. That doesn't help. Um, and Che Francis is uh, speaking to Jonathan Flowers about, yes, the, the, spe the specific, the recent release. Whiskey Wookie is saying, going with the crowd on this one, B. I would say that I, I noticed that, uh, Wookie, I noticed that the crowd were going with Glen Ord. Um, and there is a wee bit of banana skin down there because uh, back in the 19th century, um, it was written in the whiskey uh, distilleries of the United Kingdom that Glenord was notable and that it used worm tubs and shell and tube condensers. That's long uh, a figment of history now. Actually, the one that's famous nowadays is Knock Do. Anok uses worm tub condensers and shell and tube. So there you go. I think that caught a few people out right at the end. Um, and I have to admit, there is an ass hat to close out tonight. It is going to be a bit of an ass hat question. Let's see how the scores are doing. One glass man is already in a pass mark at six. Zenbud, good to see you in, my friend. Good to see you. It's Thomas that, um, oops, it managed an eight. Rusty on seven and nine, fantastic. Jesse Voicen on eight. Jesse, good to see you in, my friend. Good, good to see you scoring. Snapper XV on eight. John de la Cuisine on seven. <laughs> Alexandru saying RIP. Sorry, Alexandru. <laughs> it doesn't seem like you did too well tonight. And Jay Francis is on seven. Dogs of no ankles, seven. Andrew Butler on nine out of nine. There he is. He's hanging in. There's a chance that our Andrew could get a 10 out of 10 tonight. Jerry Miller, so nervous on nine out of nine. Fantastic, Jerry. Superb. <laughs> Oh dear, <laughs> this is where I get nervous too. A couple of them hoping to get 10 out of 10. Let's see how the ass hat treats you both tonight, Jerry and Andrew. Uh, good luck, everyone. How many Scotch malt distilleries are currently active, more or less? The same as the number of A, pounds required to buy JW Blue. This is UK pounds, of course, buying it in the UK. B, litres per annum, and uh, sorry, LPA, litres of pure alcohol, I apologise, in a, in a hogshead, in a hoggy. Or C, miles to Campbelltown from Edinburgh. Graham Fraser is saying, oh, always an asshat at the end. Five out of nine and then an asshat. Doesn't matter, Yen, you've already got your pass, Mac. You're in good shape. Relax, just go with it. So I'm asking you, how many Scotch malt distilleries are currently active, more or less? It's really, really difficult to get a final count. Um, even the SWA's information is wildly out of date. Any publication you pick up, it's really tough to understand. So many are opening all the time. True ass hat, Roy says Lucas. Chris Pollock, that qualifies as an ass hat, absolutely. But how many Scotch malt distilleries are currently active? The number of pounds that requires you to that you would be required to buy a bottle of JW Blue in the UK, uh, litres of pure alcohol in a hogshead, or miles to Campbelltown from Edinburgh. Let me tell you, it would take you £130 to buy JW Blue. 
it would be around litres of pure alcohol in a hoggy is probably somewhere in the order of 160. And the miles to Campbelltown from Edinburgh is about 185. Does that help you? I hope so. Bottle of Johnny Walker Blue in the UK is about 130 to 140 pounds, and that's roughly the amount of active Scotch malt distilleries operating in Scotland. Um, and it was A, was the answer to the asshat tonight. Did we manage? <laughs> it's not a true asshat question unless distillery capacity is part of the question, says Jimmy Legg, and he's quite right as well. <laughs> Aye, maybe not menno levels of asshattery, but hopefully something to fox you at the end, but also to make you consider, wow, it's £140 nearly for a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue. It's 185 miles from Edinburgh to Campbelltown, which is about five and a half hours. You can get to Manchester quicker than you can get to Campbelltown from Edinburgh. That's how tricky that journey is. It's even uh, about four, four and a bit hours, I think, even from Glasgow, four and a half hours from Glasgow. Um, and, and, and of course, you understand that, yes, a hog's head can be 225 litres, 250 litres perhaps, but in terms of LPA, it's down about 160 litres of litres of pure alcohol in there. So, yes, I'm trying to justify my ass hattery. <laughs> and Jerry Miller's been tripped up on the ass at the end. I'm so sorry, Jerry. Yeah, let's see if we can find Andrew. Andrew Butler did get his 10 out of 10 and he's mopping his brow. Well done, Andrew Butler, uh, the learned, uh, educated, and no doubt erudite gentleman that you are, Andrew, as well. Well done, Jerry. I'm so sorry uh, that the ass hat took it away from you at the end. I hope, my friend, you can still celebrate a wee 9 out of 10 tonight. I'm going to read one more, just as a final wee bonus of uh, the, the questions they've got left and the, sorry the wee stories that we've got left and i'll read this one out from menno menno's multi-mission over in belgium and he's talking about specifically the third moment he talks about going through his episodes with lefroy and big bold flavors but by the time he gets to his third trajectory altering moment he says it came when I was given a bottle of compass box spice tree as a gift for my 35th birthday. It was such a beautiful looking bottle, I just had to go and look up some more information about it. In doing so, I stumbled upon this Scotsman on YouTube sitting in a damp little hut somewhere, wearing a thick checkered vest and a flat cap, ranting about the SWA. He was so passionate and knowledgeable, it made me realise I knew next to nothing about whiskey, a drink I had fallen in love with, and down the rabbit hole I fell. We can relate. I think we can all relate, Menno. I'm very, very happy to have Menno and all of you sitting in this wee comfortable, cosy rabbit hole with me. Uh, fantastic stuff. JW is the default flex by a non-whiskey enthusiast at Chinese roundtable dinners. I think a lot of that goes on uh, everywhere, Yong, uh, Yonggo, uh, not just in, in those particular dinners. Uh, JW Blue is that kind of father-in-law gift, isn't it? <laughs> and a lot of, is cheaper than a lot of Macallan these days too, and more available. Alex is saying, I blave the man in a cave for my whiskey consumption too. You're talking about Keith out in Ohio. I hope you, you are talking about that. Uh, Keith, Alex, I love watching Keith too. Chris Pollack is saying, Mr. Mitchell again, absolutely. Ralphie has been so... Um, and, and that's kind of the thing, you know, that Ralphie, it was interesting to him talk, talking about not being an expert. Um, and I've talked about this at length, that, you know, I'm sitting here in front of you. I'm very privileged to be here. But I don't know any creator or channel or broadcaster or whatever in Whiskey on YouTube that refer to themselves as an expert. And that's not the dynamic we have got going here. It's not our value. We are enthusiasts. We've been bitten by the thing, much like all of you in all of these stories. And we're here to share it with you. And yes, as time goes on and our whiskey journey develops, we do build up a library of experiences. And we like to share that with you too and hopefully help guide you. You only need to be a page or two ahead of your pupil to be a teacher in the words of the Whiskey Rev. The Whiskey Rev also told me that I'm only two sermons away from an empty church or two bad sermons away from an empty church as well. So I hope that wasn't the case for tonight. If you did enjoy it tonight, eh, please give me a wee thumbs up as well. And I hope that all of you have discovered 
through sitting down with peers as opposed to experts or connoisseurs or mentors, whatever they may be. I hope you've enjoyed seeing the YouTube community as your peers and your friends and people that you come to trust and maybe your palates align from time to time. It's just all about good experiences. Everyone is saying fair winds and falling seas, friends. Thank you for sharing a dram with me. Thank you, Chris. Thank you too. What you're saying, Ralphie started many a person's whiskey journey, I don't doubt. And if he didn't start it, he certainly set it off on a very positive footing, no doubt. Uh, Helen is saying Aquaviti, superb VPUB again. Thanks, Roy. See you next week, Slancha. Helen, thank you so much. I appreciate it because we, we don't need to have the big ticket guests in all the time. Uh, we can do community things. We can do uh, different things with this session. It's just the more we can make it feel like going out and hanging out in a pub, the better. More of these solo VPUBs, please. Guests are great, but I believe more of, more of most of us come here for each other and Aquaviti. Jimmy, thank you very much for the sentiment. Um, I appreciate it, I really do. I will try to uh, bring interesting guests for us all to hang out with too. But it's nice that I get to hang out with you in a wee solo session as well. Helen is saying, best community ever. I agree, Helen. Thomas Helmer is saying, I'm not asleep, so it must have been a good sermon. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Chris Pollock is saying, there is a reason we all, all end up here every Thursday. Thanks, Roy. Chris, thank you so much. And Mark G is saying, cheers. Aquaviti, thank you to Mark G too. Thank you to all for hanging out with me on another Thursday night as a wee dram comes in from Jerry Miller. He's not angry with me then about the 9 out of 10. Still waiting for that first 10. Jerry, you'll have it, my friend. Don't worry. Maybe it'll happen on a night where it's just Jerry. And if it doesn't, you'll be able to share the success with loads of folk, hopefully. Jerry, thanks very much for your virtual dram. Jimmy Legg, thank you for your dram. Thank you all for your great support. Cheers. Thank you to everyone for another fantastic wee Thursday night. I've thoroughly enjoyed hanging out with you, sharing all these community stories and recalling some of the whiskies and the moments that have kind of shaped where I am here today. And if I leave you with one thing, it's this. Please don't say I don't like. Understand that it's probably just you're not ready to like it yet. I don't like Bomore. I don't like the herbal. I don't like the lavender. I don't like that odd thing that happens in Bomore. It tastes some thing between like basil to me at one moment if it's bad it's like some place a cat's been but more just I've never understood it and then my best whiskey of 2020 and something that's now sent me down a Bamore rabbit hole is an 18 year old Bamore. it has those notes that I'm talking about but they're in check they're integrated they're part of the rest of the whiskey it's all mango and tropical peach and fruit and and just an amazing thing. Sit with it and then suddenly you realise there's peat and smoke bringing a savoury lick. Sit with it a wee bit longer and that thing you hated is there. But it's delicious. And you understand why people rave about Bamor. And it's been probably mishandled. So even now, in 2020, when I discovered this bottle, I'm being taught still to stop saying I don't like. <laughs> Beautiful whiskey folk, dedicated barflies, you're all very dearly loved. I look forward to hanging out with you next week and we can try and untangle some of the mysteries behind Japanese whiskey. Until then, I'll raise a glass and say thank you all for your support. You're all very dearly loved. Slanchiba. Like a villain 16. Thank <laughs> you.